Okay, let's uh, let's start. Uh, then I'm really happy. My name is Avida Tedis. I'm really happy to say welcome to all speakers and all participants on be on uh, on my side and of course on behalf of of uh, the co-chair of this webinar. These are Sara Lauretti and and Gaspare Varvaro on behalf of the program committee chair that is Dino Fiorani and of the chairs of the steering committee that are Regine Persinki and uh, Jerome De Pero. Uh, actually, uh, the idea is that uh, this fall we should organize the three nano conference in Rome, but it was impossible basically uh, for a pandemic situation. And for this reason, we decide <clears throat> to postpone the conference to the next year, but we will discuss details later. And for this reason, um, we decided to organize this uh, live webinar. As you can see uh, in the bottom of this slide, the main institution organizing the, this webinar, let's say, are uh, LM Quadro Lab, our group that uh, is, uh, is quite well known in the magnetic community. And uh, from 2018, now we have, we have a new configuration with two branches. One branch, historical branch in Rome, and the new branch of the group in Genova. As you can see, this is the part, the staff of the group, and also that will take care of, of course, of the organization of the next conference. And of course, we have also a certain number of uh, PhD students and postdocs that will help us uh, to organize this kind of event. Then um, the chair of the conference will have the support of all the group. Uh, as you can see, some of them are uh, in red squares because there are the new people entering the group and they are uh, just joining us now. Uh, just quickly, <clears throat> uh, we try to organize this webinar in a short version, but try to keep as much as we can uh, high level inviting uh, very good speakers, high scientific profile and following more or less the topic that are based in this webinar and that will be the fundamental base for the next conference. As you can see, we will move from advanced, advanced design and synthesis. Of, uh, of course, we will discuss about colloidal systems and self-assembling. And then we will have uh, both, I mean, theoretical point of view and experimental point of view in terms of characterization. And we will have a quite wide overview on application on nanomaterials in different environmental environments like energy, life science, and additive manufacturing. We, are, we have seven invited talks that we organize in two sections. The first section will be chaired by Sara Lauretti, and we will have four invited contribution. Then we will have a short coffee break. And then the second session will be chaired by Gaspare Barbaro, <laughs> uh, leaving the closing remarks to our uh, let's say scientific father and program committee uh, chair Dino Fiorani. I will not take more time, just uh, I will wish a good webinar to all uh, speakers and participants. And um, so welcome again and good job. <clears throat> then I guess that now Sarah can, can take the, the floor, let's say. Thank you. Uh, Davide and welcome to everybody to this uh, first session and the first speaker of uh, this session and of this uh, uh, webinar is uh, uh, Oliver Gutfleisch. So Oliver he is a full professor for functional materials at the Technical University of Darmstadt and he is the scientific director at the Fraunhofer Institute of Material Recycling and Resources Strategies. So Oliver, he is really a leading expert on permanent magnets for energy applications and to all the related issues uh, for the resource efficiency processes and recycling of rare heart magnets. And we are very glad to, uh, to have uh, him for this first presentation that will be focused on magnetic materials for efficient energy conversion. So if Oliver can share the screen and I will leave uh, him uh, about 20 minutes uh, uh, for his presentation and uh, we will uh, keep uh, the last 10 minutes uh, um, for uh, questions. So I invite all the people attending this uh, 
uh, webinar to use the uh, chat or questions and answer uh, window to uh, to write the, uh, the questions and at the end I will uh, collect uh, the uh, questions and of course if uh, uh, during the last minutes so you, you can also uh, ask for additional uh, uh, comments. So uh, welcome Oliver and I uh, let you speak. Okay, good afternoon everybody and thank you Sarah and David and the organizing team um, yeah, for bringing us together here and, and letting me start this webinar. Uh, it's new to me that I only have 20 minutes, so I might need to improvise a bit. Uh, I thought I had, uh, let's say, almost 30 minutes. Anyway, I will talk about magnetic materials for efficient energy conversion. It's fine, and, Oliver. You can keep the time if you want. <coughs> Just to let, and, leave, leave a few minutes for the questions. And uh, I think as it's the first talk, it's maybe appropriate to look into the energy relevance of magnetic materials. And very briefly, I will touch on uh, the ideas of criticality. That is a concept we pursue together with the Fraunhofer IWKS, the Institute for Resource Strategy. And then I will go into the de design and the mastery of hysteresis, specifically for permanent magnets. That is a central topic in our corporate research center, which basically deals with hysteresis design of permanent magnets and uh, magnetocalloic materials, but here I will focus only on some, let's say, I would say, new concepts uh, on permanent magnets, which relates uh, to, uh, because it is a nano conference, it relates to interface control, to uh, perfect defects, our search for perfect defects. Basically, I want to explain that we always need uh, defects for permanent magnets, but we need the good guys and need to avoid the bad guys. And uh, so just a general scenario, looking a bit globally, uh, if you look at uh, the, the big transformation, we state that the energy transition is a material transition and that the mineral intensity for this great transformation to a carbon neutral society is growing very quickly. And that is in, the, in the, the quest to answer the challenge that wind, water, sun are intermittent, are discontinuous, and we need new technologies for conversion, storage, and transport. And this is where magnets actually play a big role. And as I mentioned, um, the mineral intensity is growing, but also the criticality of a metal needs to be assessed so that we can answer appropriately how Green is actually a strategic metal, for example, the light or earth element neodym for a green technology such as a wind turbine. And so what is the environmental footprint for a renewable technology and what are mitigation strategy to improve the resource basis for the great transformation? So um, I will be very quick here, but just refer you to the semi-quantitative representation of raw material flow. That's a relatively recent uh, EU chart. And you see on the top left here, uh, the very high criticality of lighter earth and heavier earth elements. Then the key technologies identified, in my opinion, not complete. For example, cooling is missing there. And we work on magnetocaloric cooling. Cooling is something which will, uh, uh, keep us busy over the next decades very much so. Uh, so that is, for example, a technology overlooked here in this foresight. Uh, but you see then the material flow of the rare earth elements to wind, to motors, into the sectors of renewable and e-mobility. So I guess we have here largely a magnetism community. Um, that is uh, the report of the International Energy Agency, uh, the, the roadmap, the pathway to to net zero by 2050, 220 very nice pages. Uh, you read about how wind is increasing, um, how electric car sales will increase, how the criticality will increase. But the word magnet, by the way, you don't read here. Yeah, um, so that is an interesting observation. And our central claim is, of course, that magnets are key enablers in a net zero emission future. Uh, and I give here only very quickly um, some key numbers. So for an electromotor, 
and you know the numbers, the different predictions, uh, assuming the different scenario, like the reference technology scenario, two degree below two degree scenario, uh, we can anyway uh, state we need about 700 gram of light reverse element neodym uh, for an, one electric car. We need about 200 kilogram uh, of neodym per megawatt for a direct drive wind turbine. So you would now have 10, 12, 14 megawatt installed uh, in an offshore wind turbine. Um, that means, for example, up to seven ton of high performance magnets and 38% of this would be then uh, our uh, critical strategic metal reverse. In automatization robotics, we will need lots of magnets. And I don't have the time to go into this uh, topic today, but in cooling, we also uh, will need high performance magnets. We estimate in a, uh, let's say, advanced stage that we need about one and a half kilograms of neodymium per kilowatt cooling power. Our corporate research center here in Germany, uh, together with University of Duisburg-Essen and the Max Planck Institute of Iron Research in Düsseldorf and Andruska Center Nulich started almost two years ago. Uh, one of the main themes is that we want to decipher the DNA of hysteresis and specifically that for permanent magnets and magnetic calorics. So that's what we try to visualize here a bit on all length scales. And we need to look into the spin orbit coupling for maximized hysteresis for permanent magnets. And we need to look into the spin phonon coupling um, for the minimized hysteresis for magnetic calorics. But in both cases, we will have contributing the electron, the lattice, and the spin degrees of freedom, which are entangled, which cross talk, and that is very nice fundamental material physics uh, to learn about. We also designed here, or let's say summarize our ideas in the house of hysteresis, uh, where we, I, I don't go through all it, but basically on the left-hand side, we look into the intrinsic parameters or uh, contributors on atomistic and collective mechanisms. And then we also <clears throat> look into the extrinsic um, yeah, um, features like microstructure, defects, grain sizes, but also then into the kinetics and the dynamics of magnetization reversal, or on also on the transitional kinetics of a magnetostructural transition in a Heusler alloy, for example, relevant for magnetocalorics. The idea is that we ultimately are able to manipulate locally and effective thermal and magnetic hysteresis so that we can bring uh, our, let's say, novel materials to its physical limit. And um, so just as a quick reminder for permanent magnets, uh, but of course true for almost all uh, magnetic materials, we have our intrinsic parameters, we have the characteristic micromagnetic length scales, and then we need to understand how these micromagnetic length scales let's say, um, crosstalk or couple with our microstructure so that the end we get uh, here very quickly, our extrinsic properties, our hysteresis loop. And uh, by the way, especially for permanent magnet is very interesting that we need to solve this Brown paradox, which is this huge discrepancy between the anisotropy field and the coercivity. And that is one of the challenges we are uh, basically taken on. Um, so bulk magnetic materials, to bring them to the physical limit here, I plotted the energy product versus temperature for the most important classes of material. So we have the high performance, high cost per earth. Um, and you see that 241 Nidvan bone is outperformed at already relatively uh, moderate temperatures like 100. 80, 200 degree by the summer arm cobalt pinning type system. And we have here then uh, the low cost, low performance magnets. And we want to basically close this large performance gap by a new substitute magnet and find a superior magnet uh, at high temperature. So this is then our playground where we also give more emphasis then to secondary functionalities 
uh, in addition to these prime figures of merit in terms of magnetic performance by additive manufacturing and Dieter Zeus as a follow-up speaker will explore that more. And then the localized material states, but also directional properties, for example, in terms of thermal and electric uh, conductivity. So our playground is that we want to make heavy rare earth free magnets, first of all, that we look into rare earth lean systems, like a 112 type compound, that we want to utilize what we call the free rare earth, for example, CM and Lansonum are cheap and abundant rare earth, so there's nothing rare about it. And then ultimately also moving to rare earth free magnets like manganese, aluminium, or Heusler type materials. So here now, uh, just the basics, that is a very good uh, permanent magnet. As you know, that is state of the art. We see the uh, easy and hard directions of magnetization um, and the crossover of the easy magnetization and the hard direction of magnetization somewhere down here, that is an anisotropy field of this compound. Uh, on the mesoscopic scale, we see by Kerr microscopy, nice the qualitative reflection of texture of uh, stripe line, uh, the domains, and this uh, second pattern here up with a C-axis perpendicular uh, to the imaging plane. Now it is all about understanding what is happening on the nanoscale at these interfaces, at the grain boundary. So you see here uh, three different backscattered electron images, and we basically need to understand why magnetization reversal nucleates at such a point at a triple junction, for example, or uh, somewhere else, how it then propagates. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, for uh, um, Dominic Givaud developed beautiful models to describe this. Um, and here now looking further, going higher with resolution with uh, transmission electron microscopy, we see more of the grain boundary phase, even going further. We see then that is a one to two nanometer amorphous layer here, bottom right. And we need to understand the nanochemistry, but we also need to understand um, yeah, the, the distortions, the defects around this grain boundary phase. So one effective way of uh, making good use of the heavy rare earth elements, bottom left, you see the intrinsic properties. You see the well-known very high anisotropy field of uh, the dysprosium ion born 241 counterpart. Um, we also see that magnetization drops due to the antiparallel coupling of dysprosium with the iron sublattice. Um, but you see here that with grain boundary diffusion process, we don't dilute this prosium into the volume of the material, but we keep it at the grain boundary. So we don't suffer from this antiparallel coupling and we keep up a very high remanence and with small amounts of this prosium effectively distributed along and in the vicinity of the uh, grain boundary phase, we then can bring up coercivity effectively. So we get in uh, such a shell-like structure, you see the light ring here, which uh, represents the dysprosium enrichment. Uh, next, we can do micromagnetic modeling. And we see here how nucleation happens as usual at the grain boundary. But here on the computer, you can show that easily that if we bring up the uh, anisotropy constant at the grain boundary, then nucleation ultimately will happen and start from the center of the grain. And that of course is a much uh, improved scenario. So now here I show you um, some of our, let's say new ideas about interface design, about searching for perfect defects and trying to challenge the ground paradox and permanent magnetism. Um, a lot of talk has been, uh, and, and people were are dreaming of the so-called textured nanocomposite magnets. There's an old paper by Cohen Skomsky proposing that, uh, let's say, architecture, but it has never been realized in a bulk system. There were some, let's say, good advances in synfill multi-layer structure. So here we propose a new concept uh, in this joint work with NIMS Tsukuba 
uh, where we apply a reversible hydrogen absorption and desorption process to a rare earth deficient base alloy. So that tends to be have, have some excess of uh, iron. And you can see here in the TM microscopy that we manage to distribute iron precipitates within this hard magnetic matrix. And you also see if you're familiar with exchange coupled systems that this iron precipitate is actually significantly larger of an exchange coupled system where we usually aim at 10 nanometer grain size. Anyway, to cut this a bit short, it is interesting and we could show that here that we get a, a textured anisotropic material with iron exchange coupled despite the fact that we get single phase de uh, demagnetization loop despite the fact that the iron is larger. So that we consider very promising and we explain that with a very sharp and defect-free interface of alpha iron to 2141. And then maybe uh, sort of in what uh, Dieter Suess uh, will also talk about, uh, selective laser melting is a big challenge for rare earth intermetallics and for additive manufacturing because we basically wipe out this nanostructure I just described uh, and here we designed a new alloy based on prosodium iron and copper and boron. Uh, and again, to cut this story short, it is we can basically selective laser melt it, get full dense, fully dense printed parts, and then do a post anneal, and we get a decomposed new structure out of 2141 and new and new. Uh, completely different grain boundary phase of a 631 phase. So in a way that is quite a new coercivity mechanism. And this is now an alloy which is stable in the selective laser melting process, which is different from conventional uh, 241, let's say, compositions. Okay, now let's, let me turn uh, quickly to Samarm cobalt. These are the classical pinning type magnets, but they are still full of surprises. You see here the typical, uh, let's say, cellular or diamond-like uh, uh, structure in these two crystallographic directions. And we have, uh, so that is basically a system which is nanoscale regular by a decomposition reaction. And we couple here three ferromagnetic phases on the nanoscale together. And we have complex uh, gradients of the anisotropy constant and these interfaces. So, but what we could show here in our relatively recent work, we look with advanced microscopy at, for example, this zirconium rich lamella phase uh, could resolve its composition and structure um, with uh, atom probe. And there's still a lot of ongoing work, for example, with uh, our colleagues from Max Planck and Düsseldorf. You can then also see. Uh, how these phases are distributed here on the nanoscale. Uh, but importantly, we could show uh, with micromagnetic simulation that uh, the strongest pinning site actually is the intersection of the 1,5 boundary phase with the zirconium ridge lamella phase. So that is a, a new insight into a very old system which basically supports us in our idea of trying to search for the perfect defect. Okay, now I uh, stay with Samarm Cobalt, but this is now uh, the one five system. And here in a cooperation with KIT Karlsruhe, uh, the idea was that we have a voltage controlled charging and discharging of Samarm Cobalt five with hydrogen. Basically we have a magnetoelectric tuning of uh, magnetism. And this was shown uh, on, on very thin films, but here we can extend it to uh, several hundreds of micron and uh, yeah, almost, let's say, becoming a uh, bulk. So we have here our uh, working electrode, which is a mild cobalt five, the counter electrode. And we can then uh, have this hydrogen adsorption mechanism first, reaction one, and then hydrogen. Uh, absorption into the bulk uh, durch, uh, by interstitial absorption. We have here the uh, voltagram showing that. And the interesting thing is that we can reversibly manipulate 
um, let's say, coercivity, or first of all, anisotropy, and resist and coercivity by more than one order of magnitude. And that is interesting because uh, anisotropy uh, should only uh, decrease by about 30% when uh, one five is charged with hydrogen. Uh, saturation will also be changed, um, but actually uh, coercivity, we change it by more than one order of magnitude. And that is related to the fact, this is a follow-up paper here, again, with KIT and MPIE. Um, you can see in this mesoscopic or microscopic Kerr imaging that magnetization reverse, we can see it, for example, here nicely, is initiated at a grain boundary in 217. And that is something people look, normally don't look at because people only look at the cellular structure. So, and what we can show then uh, with a very nice uh, advanced atom probe or by the colleagues in Düsseldorf, it is that uh, the grain boundary in 217 is uh, the phase which preferentially absorbs hydrogen significantly. And that acts then at the nucleation site where magnetization reversal propagates. And that is why we are able to switch to such a large extent over uh, yeah, by 1.3 Tesla, uh, the, the coercivity reversibly by hydrogen absorption and desorption. So that's very interesting to use my, uh, hydrogen as a probe to understand uh, nanoscale magnetism better. Okay, so I have uh, one more example here. This is now a so-called Röhr's lean system because we only have one samarium and 12 iron or better, a little bit of titanium to stabilize this 112 structure. So we made single crystals. Here's our classical 241. Uh, and we also made the 112 single crystal. And if you use the copper, the magnetic hardness factor as defined as here, then you actually can see that the copper for 112 is higher than that of 241. So here you see the domain images of the single crystals. And then if you look a bit closely, you can see bottom right that this is no longer a real single crystal, but see, we see in 112 the formation of a twin structure. And uh, so this is something which we need to um, learn about. And here we made then a poly or polycrystals out of the same material. Yeah, so that's uh, now the counterpart from single to polycrystal. And then we go further and here you see now, uh, um, that we have the 112 polycrystal. This is a grain boundary here. And you see how the big grain is intersected by a twin boundary here. And then if you look with a Kerr microscopy, we can see under uh, a, a, the applied magnetic field that the um, Magnetization reversal is now not nucleating at the grain boundary as you would expect, but it's nucleating and propagating from the twin boundary. And that actually uh, shows us that we have here now a new weak link. Uh, and we try to understand this again. We prepared by FIP this twin boundary by atom probe. It could be then uh, basically uh, analyzed further and by high resolution. Uh, transmission electron microscopy again, so that we can see it's a 329 uh, structure type, three-dimensional object actually. And then uh, Thomas Schreffel then also uh, did some micromagnetic simulations and could show how strong the effect is on the, of the twin boundary on uh, the coercivity, how let's say uh, much, how efficient it is to kill anisotropy. So then, of course, you can ask how can we solve that? Uh, and we find that the twin boundary formation is very significant in large grains, uh, larger than one micrometer. And then there are different strategies, uh, very briefly here, how to um, basically uh, avoid the twin formation. And uh, one uh, strategy was pursued here with the partners in Bilbao and Delaware. Um, and you could see that by grain size reduction, we change the volume to surface energy ratio, which uh, decreases the need for stress relief, which is the main driving force for the twin formation. So if you go nano, 
then we actually can get significant coercivities like it is shown here in the 112 system. Okay, um, well, very briefly, uh, this is manganese aluminium. Just to mention, I don't have time anymore, but what is happening here, uh, we can induce dislocations by um, uh, deformation, and we see a positive effect of the dislocation on coercivity, or vice versa, we see a negative effect of a twin structure, uh, like shown before on the coercivity. So it's a nice example of good and bad uh, defects. And let me in a last slide extend uh, and uh, here a little bit to soft magnets. That is some recent work uh, together with uh, uh, the Dirk Grabe group at Max Planck in Düsseldorf, where we address uh, also the secondary properties like mechanical strengths um, here in a, a high entropy, non equiatomic high entropy type alloy. Um, and you see these precipitates forming and the combination of mechanically ultra hard and strong with magnetically ultra soft properties can be achieved here. So there's also something we find very interesting for the future. That is my summary slide. Uh, we have the duality of defects. We alter local anisotropy. So the bad guys would serve as nucleation sites, good guys would uh, basically act as pinning sites. And I could extend that a little bit more as a, there's a lot to be said, uh, but of course there's also a lot of scope in the rational hysteresis design the machine learning approaches um, and uh, also I would say targeted additive manufacturing uh, and this is maybe a good handover then to uh, Dieter Süß. Okay, and that would be then my acknowledgement slide to our group and to various partners and funding agencies and for those who are interested a bit of further reading. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oliver, for this very nice presentation. I, I want to, to ask something to Oliver. Uh, you have presented very good approaches for the uh, improvement optimization uh, processes to control to tune uh, uh, the uh, the properties of these uh, uh, materials. <laughs> Are you simultaneously accounting for the uh, let's say end of life uh, processes of these materials? Uh, and uh, I, I refer to the recycling. So. Mm, uh, have yeah. you tried to consider, I mean, as in the meantime, you optimize your materials and you uh, find uh, good processes, are you simultaneously accounting for the recycling of the, these materials? Well, uh, I didn't have time to touch on this, but we are working heavily on the recycling, uh, mm -hmm. especially on, on medium arm bone. Of course, the econom economics are a question uh, that depends on, I could talk forever on that, but uh, that depends on, on prices and who makes the prices and who pays the price. Yeah, that is a rather complex question um, and we need legislation and these things will change. Um, but the simple answer is, uh, Yes, of course, we try to design our materials from the beginning in such a way uh, and that, the, uh, that is uh, on an element material, but also on a process and a device level. So we have these four levels of consideration where we need to consider end of life and the prospect to bring something into a circular economy. Yes. That is very important indeed. Thank you. Okay. Just a curiosity, because you were speaking, uh, first of all, thank you very much for this very interesting overview and talk. So I just have a, a curiosity about uh, uh, L10 rare free uh, uh, permanent magnets. So can you add a comment about L10 iron nickel uh, alloy? So do you think that so it's quite famous, this alloy, but do, do you think that it's realistic 
that uh, it's possible to obtain a, a permanent magnets uh, uh, just using iron nickel or, or not, according to your experience? In, in the okay, yeah, uh, interesting question. And indeed, we are working on iron nickel um, because it's an absolutely fascinating topic. Um, but of course, there's a big but I showed in the beginning that we need to transfer, uh, let's say even, and that is a huge challenge. If we manage to get L10 nickel in the ordered phase, nobody has shown that. Uh, if that was possible, um, then you still have the big challenge to make a, a, an appropriate microstructure. Yeah, to get the, the thermodynamic compound with the intrinsic properties, which might be interesting is one thing, but to actually make a magnet, which has a right, uh, let's say microstructure to have significant coercivity is uh, a huge challenge. I remind you the Brown paradox tells us that we get maybe 20% of coercivity uh, of the anisotropy field into coercivity. And uh, then you are, need to look at the kappa, the magnetic hardness factor, yeah, which I introduced. And then you see that the anisotropy of iron nickel, even if you manage to get it, is not so high. And if you assume 20% in the ideal world remains of that, then you, are, you don't have a very good permanent magnet. So let me say that a little bit carefully. But that doesn't mean that it's a, it's a beautiful topic and we try all sorts of things uh, not very successfully to induce iron nickel. Yeah. So, but as a permanent magnet, if somebody promised you that, I would be, I wouldn't buy it. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very Thank much. You. There is also another question from uh, Professor uh, Figueredo Neto. Sorry for my pronunciation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. I, I have a doubt. Do you think that it's possible to make a material? with a, a magnetorheological fluid in a polymer, you can orient the, the big particles or clusters with the, the field and after with uh, UV, for example, you can polymerize this and have a solid material, not just to work with crystals. You, you believe that it's possible? Or is there an attempt in this uh, subject? Do you mean to, instead of a magnetorheological fluid, have a magnetoelastomer embedded in a, in a, in a polymer? Yes, yes. Yeah. And after so you I, can... I would, I, we did that, yeah. yeah. I would say the simple answer is yes, but there's a lot of future there where I, for example, would like to talk more with Dieter Zeus um, yeah, because uh, in terms of, let's call it soft magnetic robotics uh, is something which I would consider very interesting. And your question maybe aims a little bit in that direction. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think it's time to move uh, to the next speaker. So okay. welcome Dieter Suas, Professor Dieter Suas, uh, to to this um, to this webinar. So uh, Dieter, he is a group speaker and associate professor at the University of Vienna. And uh, he gave a significant contribution to the study of exchange spring uh, media, tunneling magnetorhistor system, vortex-based sensors. And he's now expert on 3D printing technologies applied uh, for the production of magnetic composites with uh, tailored properties to match the requirements of uh, highly technological applications. And uh, so this is why we are uh, very glad uh, to have him to give a contribution about additive manufacturing of isotropic and in situ aligned anisotropic permanent magnet. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and invitation uh, to this talk. <clears throat> I hope I'm not cough coughing too much because I got COVID this week, but uh, I will really? try my best here. <laughs> so first of all, I want to thank the cooperators um, who realized uh, all these um, topics I'm going to present, which is uh, Montana University Leoben, Magnetfabrik Bonn, and uh, uh, Josef Stefan Institute in Ljubljana, and Collector Magnet Technology in Essen. I will talk about the following. I will start with an overview of 3D printing. And in particular, I will uh, review our three methods we use to realize uh, 3D printed magnets, which is fused filament fabrication, 
selective laser melting or sintering and stereolithography. I will also summarize it and compare all these three techniques. And one special topic, which is quite new, is that we uh, successfully realized that we can locally align in situ the magnetic particles using fused um, filament fabrication. If we look at the 3D printing, you have overall this uh, chart of all these different techniques. I will talk about two melting techniques, laser, selective laser melting and fused deposition modeling, and one polymerization technique, stereolithography. Um, the most common um, 3D printing technique is uh, fused filament fabrication, where you start from a um, um, filament and this filament is melted in the nozzle and layer by layer put to the building platform. I think almost every lab now has such a 3D printer in, <clears throat> in his facilities. So it's, um, you see here, the printing head with the nozzle where the melted filament comes in. The second topic I'm going to talk will be uh, selective laser sintering. And selective laser sintering and selective laser melting is very similar, just uh, the used um, laser power is different. If we talk about selective laser sintering, we just fuse uh, and sinter uh, the magnetic, the magnetic grains a little bit, but we do not melt the entire structure. So we, we don't destroy, for example, the full neotum iron boron phase but we just melt the surface of the structure, or sometimes it's also used where this neotymium iron boron, for example, is uh, covered and coated by a polymer and you just melt uh, the polymer coating with selective laser sintering. If you do selective laser melting, you completely melt the entire structure. And um, <clears throat> this was also nicely presented by Oliver Goodflash that here also uh, the existence of new phases can be realized, which gives a lot of additional flexibility and playground to this method. Of, of course, selective laser melting is much more complicated technique. <clears throat> there, there you see that here, just in the parts where the laser power uh, hits the powder, you get some um, uh, you get the solid structure and everything else is removed, the powder is removed and can be used again. These machines are of course much more expensive than uh, fused filament fabrication printers which can be purchased for 1000 euros. And the last method, which is also a very nice method because it allows very high um, <clears throat> lateral resolution is stereolithography. Here, um, a, a, the layers are scanned by visible ultraviolet light to cure the photosensitive resin. And uh, this is done by using a digital light processing engine. So this is very similar to a, a, a project, a beamer, uh, where in stereo, in parallel, different regions are cured at the same time. And you see here, all the regions which are cured at the same time, that's why it's called stereo, because it's done in parallel. And uh, only there is a photoresist resin is cured, you get the solid structure. <clears throat> we used also this technique where we put, in addition to the resin, magnetic particles, and I will compare all these results later on. But the first method I'm going to talk is fused filament fabrication. And with fused filament fabrication, you definitely only can produce polymer bonded magnets. Anyway, Polymer bonded magnets, it's a huge market for uh, high performance magnets. If you think about sensor applications where you need a very accurate field, but not a very high field strength and the high flexibility in the shape of the magnet to realize <coughs> this uh, um, particular field, uh, polymer bonded magnets is a uh, best choice. And they have about 10% market share of all neodymium iron boron magnets are polymer bonded magnets. What we did is we used a standard 3D printer and we replaced the, the, the polymer filament by a um, magnetic filament where we started from um, a neophere canules, which is an, uh, 
combination of <coughs> neodymium iron boron particles embedded in a polymer PA11 matrix. This, uh, these spheres, which are produced by atomization processes, uh, are quite spherical, which is also quite good because it gives very good re logical behavior for the 3D printing, as well as for uh, uh, injection molding. And these materials, like neodymium iron boron with BA11, exactly this uh, Neofair 2560 granules are usually used for injection molded magnets. We used exactly the same uh, material just to produce magnetic filaments using a um, <clears throat> extruder, screw extruder, and one ends up <coughs> with this uh, filament with a diameter of about 1.7 millimeter. And of course, the diameter is very important. Um, you only can allow for about 1.1 millimeter in variation, otherwise, you can't print it any longer. If we look at the filament, you still see, of course, perfectly the neotymium iron boron. Uh, Articles which consists here of a lot of uh, magnetic grains. So this is not a single crystal. So this consists of millions or billions uh, uh, of crystals with a random Z axis. This is important later on in the talk where we use also single crystals here. <clears throat> if we now compare our, our printed magnets um, with the um, hysteresis loop. <laughs> of injection molded magnets, we see that the coercive field is very similar. So we get basically the same coercive field, which is not a surprise because we used exactly the same material, but the remanence is a little bit smaller in the um, 3D printed magnets because we also have a, about 18% reduced volumetric mass density. But now we want to go a step further, and I'm going to talk about um, this new results where we used also uh, single crystals, and we used uh, uh, samarium iron nitride as well as um, hexaferrites, where each particle here now consists of a single crystal. And if we have now a single crystal, we have a preferred magnetization uh, direction. And if we apply a field, together uh, <clears throat> during the printing process, we potentially can align it. How large is the mechanical torque? The mechanical torque can be calculated in the following. So we calculate from all these particles, the total effective field on each particle, on each uh, small uh, element here, which is the sum of external field, demagnetization field, and isotropy field and exchange field. <clears throat> then we get an equilibrium magnetization, M, and the mechanical torque is then, it's maybe simpler than one might think. It's just the cross product M cross H. External is now the external field. The only important thing is M is the equilibrium position. If, if for example, we have a perfect soft magnet, M is always pointing parallel to the external field, <laughs> and then you can't uh, produce a torque. So you really need, um, for example, an anisotropy to be able to align the magnetic particles during printing. So these are now the two materials what we uh, tried out successfully. So one was a uh, strontium hexaferrite embedded in a PA6 matrix with a fill rate of about 49 volume percent. And the second one is samarum iron nitride embedded in a PA12 matrix with a fill rate of 44 volume percent. <clears throat> you see th this uh, two different Structures have also different shapes. Here we get um, quite elongated particles, whereas here for the samarum iron nitride, we have more spherical uh, structures. <coughs> we now try to uh, align them during the printing process, and we did it the following. We placed next to the nozzle permanent magnets, samarum cobalt permanent magnets. We choose samarum cobalt because of uh, the ability of samarium cobalt to be resistant to heat. And um, we built the fixing units in a way that we could easily change <coughs> the distance of this whole samarium cobalt magnets. This was important because if the magnetic uh, field is too large and we have a too large field gradient, we can't print successfully anymore. And the magnetic uh, fluid is not 
um, positioned on the building platform, but it's sucked to the poles of the permanent magnet. And also depending if we print um, the hexaferrite, uh, which has a small saturation magnetization or some arum iron nitride, which has a high saturation magnetization, we had to use a different distance between the magnets in order to successfully print a magnet <clears throat> for the small MS strontium hexaferrite, we can allow for fields of about 170 millitesla to align them for the, uh, and, and also to successfully print if we produce larger fields, which was possible in our setup. Um, the printing is not successful anymore. The magnetic fluid is not uh, put to the building platform, but sucked to the poles of the magnet. For the samarum iron nitride with a <coughs> high MS, we have to decrease the magnetic field. We have to put the magnets further away and we can only allow for 100 millitesla. And this also had a very bad consequence because for the samarum iron nitride, we could not align <coughs> the particles successfully. So if you look at the easy axis and hard axis loop and the easy axis loop is the direction of the measurement, which is parallel to the applied field during um, the printing process, it is quite similar to the hard axis loop. So you hardly see a remanence enhancement. Whereas for the strontium hexaferrite, you clearly saw that, and we clearly see that the easy axis is significantly, in the easy axis uh, direction, the remanence is significantly enhanced. This enhancement is about, um, <clears throat> MR over MS is about 0.7. In a perfect uh, sonar wolfert ensemble of non-intacting particles, with random orientation, it would be perfectly 0.5. So we see a clear enhancement <clears throat> of the remnants. You see this 0.5 also here, which is uh, the situation when you don't have an aligned magnet. Okay, so much about... Uh, the alignment in situ alignment of magnetic structures. I now quickly want to uh, cover two more topics, but not so in much detail. We also try to print exactly the same uh, source material, this um, magnetic bench S powder um, <clears throat> with selective laser sintering technique. This was done in cooperation with uh, uh, NIMS Institute, in particular. Uh, with Navid, so Hossein Sipra here, Amin, and Professor Hono, who realized um, <clears throat> the um, effect of infiltration to enhance the magnetic corrosivity because our printed magnets using selective laser sintering were very um, uh, mechanical fragile and they had a lot of microporous in a structure, but this was also helpful because it made this um, infiltration process with a high neodymium um, alloy for flakes very successful. In particular, <clears throat> this low point uh, melt compositions were used, which have always very high uh, rare earth content with the hope to enhance the corrosivity of the structure. So this, these flakes were crashed um, and put to the surface of the selective laser sintered magnet and then uh, annealed at 650 degrees Celsius for three hours. And due to this um, <clears throat> infiltration process, one can see that the initial sample hysteresis could be significantly enhanced somehow on cost of the remanence. But uh, as we hoped, one can really uh, increase the coercivity by this infiltration process. And <clears throat> the last method I want to compare is uh, stereolithography, where we uh, use this uh, photoresin, um, photoresin and put the neodymium iron boron magnetic bench S powder again in and cured it with an ultraviolet light. And if you just look at the figure here, you see that the fused filament fabrication magnet has much lower lateral accuracy than the stereolithography produced sample. In between is selective uh, laser sintered magnet. 
<clears throat> if we look at the inner structure, we also see that uh, the uh, neotumium iron boron spheres are perfectly uh, still obtained in this uh, same images. If we look here in the serial lithography case for a fused filament fabrication, um, <clears throat> we see here also uh, saccharomeration with this uh, polymer. And for the selective laser sintering, we see that partly the uh, neotumium iron boron spheres are melted. If you look at the magnetic properties, as expected, selective uh, serial lithography and fused deposition modeling have very similar hysteresis loop <coughs> as expected, because both are kind of polymer bonded magnets where we have um, a high degree <coughs> of, uh, of uh, non-magnetic uh, non material in the final magnet a little bit higher remnants as the stereolithography lithography magnet. And um, for the initial structure, the selective laser sintered magnet has the highest remnants, kind of, of course, because it has uh, no polymer inside the magnet and it's a fully dense metallic structure. Since we could use uh, the stereo lithography, we also printed a very small structure. So we printed St. Stephen's Cathedral and you see that we, uh, we could print it in its dimensions of about uh, smaller than one centimeter, and it has a feature size of about 0.1 millimeter. And the layer high resolution with serial orthography is about 60 micrometer. <clears throat> to summarize, um, 3D printing uh, of isotropic magnets can be done successfully with three techniques. <coughs> the highest accuracy is obtained by stereo lithography. Selective laser sintering can be uh, very well used if it is combined with grain boundary infiltration processes to increase coercive field. Maybe, and this is maybe also what uh, Oliver Gutfleisch will present uh, also, uh, is uh, that <coughs> here it might be also possible to, to align the particles, but the best for us, the easiest where we can align structures is using uh, fused filament fabrication, because here we can locally align the structures during the printing process. And one can print, for example, if you think of our uh, fixing units, and if you put it on a rotating platform, or when it is realized uh, by electromagnets, you can print magnets which can't be produced by other means, like a Halbach array or, the, or a modulator. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dieter. Uh, so while waiting, uh, while waiting for the <laughs> questions, I really would like to thank you. We, we really appreciated uh, your effort in giving this talk uh, in your health uh, situation. So yeah, sure, I didn't want to leave an open spot here. <laughs> yes, but really, we thank you. We, we appreciate it. And uh, I, I I really wish you good luck and uh, yeah, I, good uh, and the fast recovery. <laughs> I don't know for how, I mean how long you are in this situation, but uh, I wish you uh, fast <laughs> yeah, recovery. Thanks. Okay. So, other questions or comments for this uh, presentation? Hi, Dieter. Uh, also, for me, my, my wish for your fast recovery. Hi, it's thank you for the thoughts. Really, I think that it was not easy. <laughs> uh, thank you for the nice and very interesting talk. So. Uh, just a very quick uh, uh, question. So were you speaking about uh, uh, polymers with particles inside that you use to prepare uh, magnets by 3D printing? So if I were understood, that, so the size of the powder is around is in the micrometer range, if I were understood. Exactly, yeah. Uh, just a quick, yeah, the question is, do you think that uh, if you use uh, particles with a lower size, so you expect some change in the properties of the filament and also in the final properties of the magnets? So in the sense, you can you expect some improvement or... or, or Oh, oh, <clears throat> not know. really, I would say, because uh, the, it's a very good question, but uh, it's, I think the lateral resolution is determined by the nozzle diameter. And this nozzle diameter is determined by the, uh, by the fluid behavior of the polymer. If you make an even smaller nozzle, you can't yeah. print it, even if you don't have any, any magnetic particles inside. So even the 
even just the polymer filament can't be printed with a nozzle which has a very, very small diameter. So the <clears throat> magnetic particle is not necessarily uh, the limiting factor for the lateral resolution for fused filament fabrication. Okay, okay. But 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 you never tested with particles with different sides and uh, uh... <laughs> they are kind of so it's um, you see this um, the size of the particles were indeed almost similar. So if they are much larger, you can't print it for sure. But you see okay. that um, okay. These particles were, uh, I would say, larger, significantly yeah. larger. The, uh, the magnetic wind chest powder, they are about okay. 20, 50, 50 micrometers. The yeah. samarum iron nitride are significantly smaller. Okay. So the, they are uh, one magnitude uh, smaller. But okay. the, the resolution of the printed magnet is similar. <coughs> Nevertheless, the uh, samarum iron nitride. I think due to the smaller diameter of the uh, particles, uh, the filament has better properties. It's more, um, it's not so fragile and um, more elastic. So this samarum iron nitride was um, a very nice filament. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Dieter, again. I just want to add a similar comment to what I asked also to Oliver. So you show the comparison, for example, for the same materials with these uh, different approaches. Uh, are you consider? Are you also considering uh, what it will be the differences in the uh, recycling approaches for this kind of materials? Uh, I mean, the connection between these uh, techniques, these approaches for the fabrication, and uh, how it will be easier or to manage to handle the material at the end of the life. Um, good question. I would think that it's uh, quite similar. So all in all, all three processes use the same, needs more or less very similar magnetic source material. Uh, I would not see a big fundamental difference. I think definitely an argument is always that <laughs> if you use customized magnets, you maybe need a smaller amount of magnetic material, but concerning recycling, I would not know a, a, a clear answer if it's if one of these methods is beneficial. Okay, okay. So thank you, Dieter. Uh, are there other comments, or maybe we leave uh, Dieter uh, recovering? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, so now we move. Uh, uh, to the next uh, speaker, that is uh, the Professor uh, uh, Antonio Martin Figueredo Neto. Uh, he's a professor of physics uh, at the University of uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil, and he is the head of the National Ish Institute of Science and Technology for Complex Fluids. So uh, this center uh, uses a multidisciplinary approach to study liquid crystals, magnetic colloids, and biological fluids. So we are very happy to have this presentation by Professor Figueredo Neto, and the title is Anisotropy in the Nonlinear Optical Parameters of Magnetic Colloids, uh, the Third Order Susceptibility and the Hyperpolarizability. Thank you, uh, Professor Neto. Thank you, Sarah, for this kind uh, introduction and very, very nice. And it's a pleasure for me to, to share the time with you. I am learning a lot with two, this, this two presentations before. And uh, this is a line of research that we have in our, in our lab during some years. And we will continue this year. And the idea is to investigate this eventual, as you will see, real an isotropy uh, in the optical properties of uh, the magnetic nanoparticles. We will use the magnetic field to align these particles, and after we will use lasers basically to uh, measure these nonlinear optical properties. And these are the collaborators of this work, these different works. It's a, a bunch of works which I put together. The Kinari Parek is from India, and the others are from the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, the different uh, country we have here. 
Well, basically, uh, if you have a ferrofluid with uh, nanoparticles, typical size of about 10 nanometers, without the magnetic field is, is an isotropic fluid. When you put an external magnetic field in this material, it becomes an isotropic from the point of view of magnetism, because we will align basically the magnetic moments of the particles. So we have an uniaxial and isotropy of the fluid in the presence of the magnetic field. And the idea here is to investigate uh, really another type of uh, uh, anisotropies, which could appear in these fluids when you apply the magnetic field just to align the particles. And uh, the two parameters that we will analyze is basically the third order susceptibility and the hyperpolarizability. Third order susceptibility and hyperpolarizability here. They can be useful for applications. For example, if you take a, a, an optical fiber and you put inside uh, magnetic fluids, we can orient these particles inside the fibers and also have different properties of absorption, of reflection, of light. And for the telecommunication, it should be interesting, but also from the basic science point of view. Well, this is the outline of the talk. Uh, first of all, we will see how the particles respond to different strengths of magnetic fields. Some words about nonlinear optics and the two techniques that we use it to access the this nonlinear optical properties, which is the Z scan technique and the hyper Rayleigh scattering. After that, I will show you the results for the third order susceptibility and the first hyperpolarizability. Some conclusions and the take home message. Well, these are basically the types of ferrofluids that we investigated during this uh, research in our, our labs in Sao Paulo. Uh, some of them are made of manganese, zinc, uh, Fe204. We have spherical type particles here with typical dimension of 10 nanometers, but we can have also this type of cubic particles with the, the size of this, uh, this cube is also about uh, 10 nanometers. They are very not too much polydispersed, but we can introduce all these parameters in the analysis of the results we will have from the optical point of view and also from the X-ray scattering point of view. And the other type of samples that we uh, use it is magnetite particles, typical diameter also about uh, eight nanometers in different types of uh, liquid carrier, for example, uh, isoparaffinic oil, water, synthetic ester. So we have different types of coating of these particles to be carried by polar and non-polar fluid. The idea here is essentially to take a, a property which is characteristic from the crystal, from the particle, not from the, the carrier fluid around, or the molecules that we put around to avoid the agglomeration. So all the properties that we will discuss here are essentially part, uh, properties obtained from the particles. And the temperature uh, is below room temperature in the winter, Sara, in Brazil, 22 degrees centigrade. And uh, the particles are super paramagnetic at that temperature. Well, if we uh, apply a magnetic field of small strength in a ferrofluid, here we are a sketch of particles, which the magnetic moments, when we put a magnetic field in the presence of these particles, we have a main orientation of this uh, magnetic moment dipoles parallel to the magnetic field. But if we increase the field for a first, uh, critical field HC1, what we have is not only the orientation of the magnetic moments, but also the formation of linear clusters, some uh, aggregates which resemble some lines here, until we reach a second critical point, HC2, where 
we have the formation of bundles. So these lines will attach to each other, will form this type of very big uh, aggregates. Most of them can be uh, observed even in optical microscopes. So micro size, it can be formed. Well, in terms of linear optics, uh, just to give you a, a flavor about this, if we take the polarization, when you have a fluid or a material, in our case, the ferrofluid, and we apply an external electrical field to this, uh, to this material, what we have is the first time, a first contribution to the polarization is the first order susceptibility, which is just uh, the multiplication is something the polarization is proportional to the field and this uh, proportionalization uh, proportional constant is the first order susceptibility however if the intensity of this field is high what we have is another contribution or another contributions for the total polarization here's the second order susceptibility electric susceptibility always please and here is the third order susceptibility, which we have here the intensity of the beam explicitly placed in the formula of the total polarization that we have had there. And what happens essentially is that these different terms here are strictly related to the symmetry properties of the medium. So if you have a medium which is basically isotropic, you have a mirror symmetry, Chi 2 is expected to be zero, and Chi 3 is the first nonlinear optical term that contributes to the total polarization. And uh, the symmetry properties, so we can analyze these different symmetry properties. And what happens is that the index of refraction of this medium now for high electric fields, high incident electric fields, are dependent, it's dependent on the intensity of the beam. So here's the index of refraction dependent on the intensity, the usual linear index of refraction. And this contribution here is the nonlinear part. So we are able to measure this N2 for the different uh, ferrofluids. And this is related to the real part of this uh, electric susceptibility. On the other hand, if you take into account just the, the observers, which are inside the particles, which we can name this molecules. It's not a molecule, but Fe3O4, for example, in the crystal, we can have the polarization and the electric field here. If there is an angle between them, the energy of this coupling here is, there is a linear term here, but if this electric field is high enough, you have more terms here, which are important to define the energy of uh, this uh, dipole in the presence of the electric field. This is the dipole moment of the Fe3O4, for example, basic unity of absorption of light, the polarizability, and the first order hyperpolarizability, which is related to, for example, the second order generation. We shine a laser with a particular frequency and we will see the double frequency when the light interacts with the material. So this is the other parameter that we will be able to measure in our setups, and this will be discussed with you now. Well, as I told you, the electric susceptibility, the chi one here, this is the first order contribution of the polarization, the second order contribution, there is a tensor here, and the third order susceptibility, which is most important for us now because we are dealing with uh, isotropic fluid, we have the different components. If we orient uh, particularly the electric field and the polarization of the particles here in, a, in the laboratory frame axis in a particular way, we are able to measure at least two of these components, as we will see in the following. So our idea here today is in the case of uh, the electric susceptibility to measure this parameter or at least two of them, one parallel to the orientation of the dipole moment and the other a mean value of the perpendicular, uh, this one and that one. 
Well, the, when we speak about nonlinear optical absorptions in, uh, in materials, for example, the idea is, is very simple. If you have, uh, oops, sorry. If you have a stead, uh, ground state here of your electron, for example, and the first ex, uh, ex, excited state is here, and the amount of energy if you have in your photon is not enough to take out one electron from here from the ground to the first excited state, what happens if you have a high intensity laser shine in the sample is that the, your electron will absorb two photons. So it's a two photon absorption and you can shine your sample with uh, omega H bar omega energy of one photon. But if it uh, absorbs two photons, you have this nonlinear optical absorption, which has here the linear contribution and beta here is the contribution from this phenomena here that is the two photon absorption. And this beta here is what we can access from our experiments. So we can measure this beta value in the direction of the dipole and perpendicular to the dipole. And this beta value here is proportional to the number of absorbers you have in your sample. This is the H bar omega is the energy of the laser you are shining on the sample. And this is the cross section for the two photon absorption. So if we have this, this is known, this is also known, we are able to measure the cross section for the two photon absorption in different directions. And the other phenomenon, the nonlinear phenomenon that can occur also is in a band here. You have the steady state, you have a band, and you, you have the possibility with the absorption of H bar omega, take one electron from inside the band and put it in a higher uh, position, even inside the band. But if this uh, is due to a large number of uh, photons which are interacting with your material, the fluence that we will ins make incident in your sample and the fluence outside the sample will depend on different parameters and also is sigma here and alpha, alpha is the linear absorption. The sigma here is due to this uh, free carrier absorption. It's not uh, an absorption between two different levels, but inside a single band. Well, to measure this uh, nonlinear optical susceptibility, we use a, a technique that I will show you in the next uh, slide, which is the Z-scan technique. Basically, we are, let me see the time here. Uh, okay. Uh, is a care effect. So basically, we have a laser beam, which are uh, with a lens, a normal lens. Uh, we have a focal position, a focal point at that position. After the beam will open, you put an iris in front of the detector. And if your sample is a nonlinear optical sample or a care type medium, what happens is that if you are before the focus, we have a divergence of the field here. So less energy will go through this pinhole here, this iris. And when you cross, the focus point, it will focalize the beam. So you have more energy in, the, in this iris. And so this is the typical uh, normalized transmission as a function of the Z position of the sample. So it's, na it's named Z scan because we define the horizontal direction as the Z axis. And when we uh, move the sample across the focal point along the Z axis, we have this type of behavior of the intensity measured after the iris. So this is the typical result. In the case of electronic process, as we are interested to discuss today, we have to have a laser here, which is pulsed with pulses of about 100 or 200 femtoseconds. So what we do basically this Laser here, which is focused at that position. My God, sorry about that. That is focused at that position. After that, there is an iris here to measure in the detector D1, what happens, what's the intensity with the fluence here. But we can do also at the same time, a different type of measurement, which is the total absorption. 
How we do that? We put a beam splitter at that position. So part of the beam comes here and part of the beam is uh, focalized in the second detector. So here we will measure the nonlinear index of refraction. And in this direct, in this detector, we will measure the nonlinear optical absorption. So the idea is in principle simple. We will shine this sample here with pulses of about 200 femtoseconds. We, we keep a time to freeze the sample, to lose, lose heat from, from the sample to abroad, to the steerer, not to have a thermal effect present here, but just electronic effects. And after that, another pulse, and we measure basically this 200 femtosecond intensity at both uh, detectors. Just to give you an idea about the intensity, as I told you that this nonlinear optical effects depends on the intensity of the beam. Here is 16 gigawatt per square centimeter. So this is what we have essentially shining on the sample. And the real part of the susceptibility gives directly the nonlinear index of refraction and the imaginary part of the susceptibility give us directly the nonlinear absorption. So this is the Z scan technique. And the other technique used is the Rayleigh scat scattering, which basically we have a laser here of this wavelength here, it's red, goes through this. Uh, this is something just to, to measure the intensity of the beam, it's not important here. But after you have two lengths, what will shine the intensity over the sample, which is placed here. And due to this uh, hyper Rayleigh scattering, we have the formation of a green line, which is in terms of wavelength 532, it's the second harmonic generate, generation. And we will take in this photo multiplier, this intensity here. And in this formula, this is a simple formula, we will not have the time to enter in the details, the intensity of the second harmonic generation is proportional to the square of the intensity of the first harmonic. And all this parameter here, this is a geometrical parameter which is known. This is the number of uh, scatterers which is present in the sample, we know also. And the unit term that we need, we have to, to, to fit here, is the uh, hyperpolarizability, the first, the, the hyperpolarizability square. So it's a simple measurement also. Simple, okay, if you have the equipment, the good equipment and good people to, to work on it. So this for H equal to zero, so without the magnetic field, this is the typical Z-scan measurement. So it is related, as I told you here, to N2, which is the nonlinear index of refraction. And this is the typical absorption as a function of the Z position, normalized transmittance as a function of the Z position. And here also we have beta as the only fitting parameter. He's also one, just one fitting parameter, N2. And here also one fitting parameter, which is beta, and beta will give us uh, the second or the second two photon absorption sigma. Well, okay, so to put the magnetic field in our samples, we, we mounted this with uh, very strong magnets here, which allows us to put uh, uh, an external field of about 2,700 Ørsted, and we put this over the shearer of the Z-scan, so we can make this uh, experiments with the field during all the, uh, during all the experiment even for the hyper Rayleigh scattering, but there it's not a problem because it's a fixed uh, sample, we don't move. But in this Z-scan, we have to move the, this chariot with the sample along the Z direction. And this is what uh, we measure here for the sample manganese zinc spherical particles and cubic particles here, okay? In the orientation parallel and perpendicular to the magnetic field. Just, uh, just explain you what we are doing. We are putting the electric field of the laser beam parallel to, to the magnetic field or perpendicular to the magnetic field. And with this, we measure the sigma 2pa. So this parallel and perpendicular means parallel or perpendicular electric field and 
uh, external magnetic field. So we see the anisotropy that we see here, which depends on the intensity of the, uh, of the field. So here's this, the cross section, and here is the intensity of the field that we are able to put in the sample. It increases with uh, increasing the magnetic field. Here is for the uh, Fe304 with oleic acid. We have similar results here. You can see in the spherical particles and the cubic particles, almost the same, a little bit higher here, the anisotropy. We define the anisotropy this way, the sigma parallel minus sigma perpendicular over sigma parallel. So the anisotropy is bigger in the cubic particles and smaller than in the, in the spherical particles. But within the error, you can say that it's almost the same parameter for the crystal. The crystal is the same, Fe304. And the components of chi 3 that we measure for the, the magnetite particles here, uh, as I told you, the imaginary part of chi 3 is related to beta, to beta, and the real part of K3 is related to N2. So this is the, the direct measurement of this anisotropy along the direction of the magnetic moment or the magnetic field external applied here. On the other line, or perpendicular, we have a mean value between these two chi 3 along apps, uh, I, Greek, and Z direction. But if we assume that they are not so different here, it is interesting that if we calculate with this value, what we would expect in the case of uh, no magnetic field applied, we have essentially the same value. So it seems that this assumption we did here is, uh, is reasonable, it's not too far from the reality. Well, for the beta H now, as you remember, we have the second order intensity proportional to the square of the first order intensity and number of uh, uh, particle or number of molecules that we have observers in the sample. So this is a, uh, straight lines, even without the magnetic field here with the magnetic field H parallel to the E of the electric field and here perpendicular. So we see that this anisotropy increases here with the number of particles, with the number of particles we have there. And this uh, angular coefficient also is different from the direction parallel to the magnetic field, electric and parallel to the magnetic field, and here perpendicular. And this anisotropy is of the order of 17%. And we made X-ray scattering also to understand what's going on when we put these magnetic fields in the sample. Let me see the time here. Oh my God, I'm finished. Uh, the field that we put in our sample is a field that makes this type of linear aggregates, not bunches. We, we don't have this type of uh, big aggregates formed. And we have basically seven nanometers in that direction and about five particles, you should take a medium of uh, the diameter of particles about seven oriented along this one, one X, one, one, one direction of the spinal structure. And in the case of uh, cubic particles, what we have, when you have a small magnetic field, we have this type of aggregation, but if we increase the magnetic field, we have, oops, we have this type of modification of the basic structure along the direction of the, the field. And this is what we believe what we have, what is happening. So the take home message, I have just two more uh, slides. In the case of the magnetic nanoparticles, we have the N2, nonlinear index of refraction and nonlinear absorption measured here. And the, the hyper Rayleigh scattering giving the hyperpolarizability of this value. When you put the external magnetic field, there is a formation of small linear aggregates and the anisotropy comes. So, increasing the magnetic field, we increase the absorption along the direction parallel to the magnetic field, but in the direction perpendicular, we have almost no difference. And also here, in the case of the uh, spherical or cubic particles. 
So these are basically the take home message I leave you to, to, to read here. And uh, finally, I thank you very much. Some papers, if you are interested, we can discuss more in details. Thank you very much for your attention. Excuse me, Laura and Sara and Dan. It's fine. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. We are on time and we have we have also time for some comments. So uh, thank, uh, first of all, thank you for this uh, very clear presentation about these techniques and the physics that is uh, behind. Uh, actually, I, I read uh, a comment, a question uh, from uh, one of the participants. Can you also comment briefly on the temperature change of the particles as they interact with the laser? I think it's a good point. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. This was uh, a concern that we have when we do this type of experiment in disease and experiment or even in the hyper rate. You see that here we put uh, one uh, about 200 femtosecond laser beam shining in the center. This pool speaker here, what it does with respect to this laser, this, this laser gives several, po several pulses of, 20, of 200 femtoseconds. With the post speaker, what we have is that we have uh, about 99.9% uh, difference in intensity between this peak here and that there. But we saw that even with this 99.9% uh, .9 of uh, less intensity of the beam, if you take a lot of them, your sample will heat. So because of that, what we did, we put a shopper, a shutter here also, and this shutter will uh, cut all these small pulses, which will reach the sample during two seconds. And with this, we are absolutely sure that we don't have any thermal effect. How we are sure? We measure the thermal effect. We measure with and without this two second uh, shutter here, which cut completely the laser shine in the sample. And we see that this is independent of the other parameters that, that we have. So the heating of the sample is really a problem, but we can uh, arrange this from the experimental point of view. Thank you. I think uh, we had the, 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 the answer. Uh, we have also another question, Hamid Kachkaki, he asked yeah. me to, to, to yeah. put the question. Hello. Um, well, uh, actually, it's a, a related question regarding the magnetic state of the nanoparticles at some temperature, because I haven't seen or maybe I just missed it. What's the role of the magnetic state? Is it important? Uh, I mean, how the, how the magnetic state of the particles enter, I mean, they, these uh, affect the optical properties. Yeah, the magnetic properties acts in this experiment just to orient the particles, just to put the magnetic moment in a particular direction in the formation of the small cluster we saw. So these electrical properties, we don't know until now, because we have a, a plan to make the same type of experiments with different sizes of particles two nanometers and after magnetorheological fluids. So big nanometers, which would essentially uh, give us an idea what is the bulk properties or the bulk anisotropies. In the case of magnetorheological particles, we have about my I'm sorry, you know that actually the magnetization will enter the permittivity and yes. uh, thereby in the susceptibility, electrical susceptibility. Yes, sure, sure. But in this case, as we have about the same type of particles, same size of particles, the only difference that we could see, for example, is compare the magnetite with mag manganese zinc particles. That's mm -hmm. the only thing that we can say for the moment. But we don't know what is, uh, if you increase the magnetic moment, what is the influence in the magnetic uh, okay. Okay. receptivity. Well, thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Are there other comments or questions? Okay, so if not, let's uh, thank again uh, Professor Antonio Martins Figueredo Neto, and uh, we move to the last uh, um, talk of this uh, uh, of this session. And uh, so I'm happy to give the floor to Hamid Kachkaki. He is uh, 
full professor of the University de Perpignan and on theoretical physics, uh, and he's an uh, expert on uh, particles and uh, how they interact uh, and their role uh, uh, in uh, collective behavior. And so today he is going to present uh, a talk on uh, dynamic response of an assembly of nanomagnets, uh, AC susceptibility, and specific absorption. Uh, so thank you, Amit, that you can share your screen. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah, for the introduction, and thank you. Uh, all of you, uh, Dino, you, and Gaspar, and uh, Davide for organizing this event and for inviting me to take part. Um, well, today I will speak about a basic, some basics of the theory of, uh, let's say, dynamic response of an ensemble of nanomagnets uh, applied to uh, the calculation of specific absorption rates in um, magnetic hypothermia. Uh, okay, as you said, as, um, from the University of Perpignan, a laboratoire, a promesse CNRS in Perpignan. And this, the work I'm going to, to, to talk about is, uh, has been achieved in collaboration with my colleagues, Jean-Louis Desjardins, François Vernet from Perpignan, and Marc Respo from Toulouse. Okay, to those who don't know where... I mean, sorry. sorry are you, can you are hear you, me? No, yes, we can hear you, but uh, we cannot see the screen. Presentation. Oh, that's uh, great. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Up to now, it was nice because uh, we were looking at you yeah, and yeah. you were just uh, introducing, but uh, I think that in the, in the following, we need uh, the slides. <laughs> I agree with you. It's better with the, the slide, right? This is a work uh, about some basics of the theory for dynamic response of an assembly of nanomagnets applied to magnetic hypothermia in collaboration with Jean-Louis Desjardins, François Verrier, Ver, Vernet, and uh, Marc Respo. Well, those who don't know where Perpignan is, it's, uh, yeah, it's about 30 kilometers away from the border between France and Spain here, all right? Uh, okay, the plan of my presentation is as follows. We, uh, after a short introduction, I will speak about, as I said, some basics of dynamic response uh, but uh, rather quickly, and then I uh, apply it to a specific absorption rate and I explain what it is and uh, why we need it. And in the end, I will speak about a different, let's say, handle or means to characterize the uh, absorption of heat by um, magnetic nanoparticles. Okay, right. So, what are the main objectives? The main objectives are, let's say, to understand the thermal dynamics of nanomagnet assemblies. It's not so easy. I mean, to just uh, uh, apply straightforward, in a straightforward manner the uh, diffusion, the well-known diffusion equation of Fourier uh, analysis to, to the nanoscale. So this, there is a, uh, a huge, let's say, activity going on on this issue. Uh, now more in, let's say, uh, there is also, as I said earlier, that there is an, an interest in application of, of these developments to the uh, uh, optimization of energy absorption and its diffusion within uh, an assembly of nano, nanomagnets. And uh, as we will say at the end, uh, we need, we still need, uh, let's say, further developments of experimental and theoretical tools for efficient characterization in a view of more efficient practical applications uh, um, exemplified by magnetic hypothermia. Now, uh, what is the main objective? As I said, the main idea in this area, let's say this area of physics is to understand how to convert heat that, that's brought in by, uh, uh, I mean, to, to convert into heat, the electromagnetic energy brought in by time dependent magnetic field in an efficient manner and also in compliance with the host and medium and constraints. So there are several physical parameters that actually come into play. Uh, uh, some of them pertain to the nanomagnet themselves. I mean, the size, shape, and the line material, as a, of course, and also the assembly properties, the shape of the assembly, concentration, and spatial organization. And the third part, let's say, of a set of uh, parameters uh, are related to the uh, external stimulus in the magnetic field um, uh, and amplitude and frequency. These are, let's say, the main physical parameters that have been, uh, I mean, used as handles over the optimization of uh, um, conversion heat of uh, electromagnetic energy into heat. 
But the problem is each one of these parameters has some limitations, as you know, um, I mean, regarding the size of the nanoparticles, we cannot inject any size into the body. We cannot inject any concentration. Actually, we, we have to, to inject, we should inject the smallest quantity of nanomagnets. And, uh, and you see, uh, because of these limitations and constraints, one has to find some compromise between all these uh, possibilities. And I will try to show you some, uh, some uh, results um, um, in, in, in this regard. Now, sorry about some uh, uh, formulae. So we have to, to understand, I mean, if we want to optimize this, uh, let's say, uh, conversion of uh, electromagnetic energy into heat, this means that we have to understand the uh, absorption of the, the magnetic system. Uh, and to understand absorption, you know that it's uh, absorption is related to the to the outer phase um, component of the magnetic response of the magnetic system to some uh, time dependent magnetic field. So in general, we have the magnetization that can be written as an infinite series in the, the magnetic field H. And when this uh, the field H is a time dependent, we can actually write the response, which is also an infinite sum that involves uh, imaginary and uh, imaginary real and imaginary parts of the magnetization and the several nodes, let's say, with the high frequencies. So you can see, for example, for the linear approximation, you have uh, you know, this term that's linear in the field, uh, a cubic, a nice cubic susceptibility you, that comes with the h to the power three, et cetera. You can go to the fifth order and much higher orders. Now, this is the magnetization. Let's say general expression of the magnetization is a function of uh, some time-dependent uh, magnetic field. But what we're interested in, uh, in the internal energy uh, of the magnetic system that can be written as uh, an integral of such a quantity that was actually um, derived by Rosenweig in 2002, by integrating over one cycle of the magnetic field and this, these things are of course uh, well known and I think I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, now uh, the specific absorption rate it's also called the specific the pa loss power is of the magnetic system is the ratio or it says that this internal energy multiplied by the frequency roughly and if you integrate this quantity m of t and this is the derivative of the magnetic field with respect to time, okay? Because H is time dependent. Then you can actually show that it is proportional to the chi second, which is the uh, outer phase components of the AC susceptibility multiplied by the frequency and the square of the magnetic field. But this uh, susceptibility, as we saw earlier, is an expansion, actually. It can be written as a sum of linear contribution, cubic contribution, fifth order contribution, et cetera. All right, so uh, I'm sorry. So if we want to compute this uh, uh, specific absorption rate, which means I mean the, which is the heat power dissipated in the magnetic system divided by the mass of the magnetic substance, roughly, or let's say it's the uh, heat power per unit mass. If we want to compute these, well, we need to compute actually the, the, the susceptibility, AC susceptibility, which is, as well known, it's uh, related to the absorption. Uh, but this is the problem. The, the, let's say the, the cracks of the problem is to compute this AC susceptibility, which is the dynamical responses of the uh, complicated uh, magnetic system. Right. Well, let's consider the simplest case. Let's say we stop, I'm sorry to come back. We just stop at this first order. We just drop, let's say we drop higher orders and uh, stay, let's say in what we, what's called the linear regime. In this case, we may use the well-known Debye's model, which where the susceptibility can be written as the ratio of the susceptibility at equilibrium divided by this quantity, where gamma here is the relaxation rate, okay? or gamma inverse is the relaxation time. If we write this susceptibility as a, a real part, an imaginary part, you know all these things, we can obtain the uh, real component and the artifact component. 
But now, if you apply this uh, to an assembly of nanoparticles, you know that actually nanoparticles are interacting, actually. So you need to take into account uh, interactions and also relaxation time, because uh, you have to compute this gamma, which is the relaxation rate of the magnetization. These two things, these two quantities are rather complicated. Well, eta here is uh, just the frequent, is the quantity here, is omega multiplied by the relaxation time, is some reduced frequency. Another parameter that's very important here, that's related to the, to the assembly properties is this quantity here, is the lattice sum C00, which is actually the first of a, a hierarchy of uh, lattice sums. And this one, this guy here, just tells us how the assembly is, whether it's prolate or oblate or whatever, okay? And what's the organization, spatial organization of the, the assembly. So in brief, to summarize, in this quantity, quantity here in the susceptibility, we need properties uh, or features uh, pertaining to assembly, organization, concentration, which is your CV. Of course, we need temperature. We need magnetic field, as we will see, because we, we need to compute the equilibrium susceptibility and the relaxation rate. Well, without going into those details, uh, if you just take an example, let's say some dilute assemblies, the concentration, this dilute assembly means here uh, is uh, that the interparticle distance is, let's say, larger than three times the diameter of a nanoparticle, roughly. So we can actually show that the, the uh, sorry to go back, we have the part here that's for free, no interactions, and this part is contribution from interactions. So we can compute both contributions for free nanoparticles isolated or very dilute, okay? And the contribution from interactions. X, X is just the DC field, sigma is the well-known effective energy barrier. And what we see if we plot this, the total susceptibility here, we see actually that it depends very strongly on the shape of the sample. Here, we're talking about the sample, which is an assembly of nanoparticles embedded in some matrix which is a, a solid or liquid, whatever. So if for solid, for in the, the case of solid matrix, for example, you can organize, you can have a, the sample in the form of a square or some needle, which is a really prolate system. And we see that actually we can go from a bell-like shape you know, a, a curve. This is the susceptibility, equilibrium susceptibility as a function of the applied field for, for different shapes. So we can go from bill-like shape to some uh, monotonic uh, behavior. And this is, we will see in a bit, this is very important because if we compute now the, the SAR, which is specific absorption rate, we see actually that the behavior, this is again, the SAR is a function of the magnetic field for different concentrations this time. X is, uh, let's say, is one over the separation to the, uh, to the power three. So for example, if you take uh, X, uh, let's say, I'm just looking for some typical value. When uh, X is 10, A is 46 nanometers. A is edge to edge separation. Uh, what we see that is actually, as I said before, is that this, uh, sh this behavior, the global behavior of the SAR is just dictated by the equilibrium susceptibility, which means that the dynamics here doesn't play much of a role because actually, the temperature is a uh, rather high for such nanoparticles, which are of a diameter of about 10, 10, from seven to 10 nanometers, which means that these nanoparticles are super paramagnetic and the, the loss via, let's say, AC susceptibility is actually dictated by the equilibrium properties. Because, uh, I'm sorry to go back, if we, we look at this uh, expression here, we have the, the susceptibility at equilibrium, and we have this uh, part that comes from the dynamics. And dynamics here, we're talking about switching of the magnetic moment between energy minima defined by the anisotropy. So the conclusion is actually this guy here in the numerator dictates somehow its behavior to the star. But another point, which is uh, very important here, is that actually uh, we can see that uh, 
dependent on the concentration, we can see that the maximum, if there is a maximum of the SAR, changes with the field. With, this means that there is a competition between the DC field and interparic interactions. Uh, because I mean, um, I mean, we can see in the literature that people think that if we increase the concentration, I mean, we will enhance the SAR. This is not really true. This depends. There is a subtle interplay between the DC field and the, 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 the concentration. Now, we know that, I mean, many people have uh, tried also to, to play, let's say, to vary the magnetic field, the AC magnetic field, the intensity of the magnetic field uh, to, to enhance the SAR. I mean, enhancing the SAR means that we are enhancing the, 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 this energy conversion from the electromagnetic form to, to the thermal form, okay? So uh, optimizing this SAR means that actually we are optimizing this magnetic hyperthermia process. So one of the parameters, as I said before, is the intensity of the, the AC field. But the problem is, as you know, there is a limitation uh, to a physio let's say physiological limits on, on the, the AC uh, magnetic field uh, amplitude and frequency. And uh, in order to, let's say, change, vary the field without reaching this limit, you know, you have to play also on frequency. So there is a, let's say, there are several parameters. And as I said before, there's a compromise. It's not always straightforward, actually, to, um, I mean, just to vary a, a parameter without, without uh, paying attention to the other ones. So for example, here, if we, we want to increase the AC magnetic field, I mean, the intensity of the magnetic field, uh, as you know, you will go out of the linear uh, regime and in this case the the SAR will will get uh, modified by some new contribution that comes here from the uh, let's say just the cubic uh, susceptibility and the the contribution become rather com complicated but the main conclusion here is that actually we can uh, we can uh, at higher fields for example 7.3 millitesla we can enhance the SAR to some to some extent. This is the, the main idea. But actually, uh, um, one should pay attention, as I said, to this ph physiological limit, because uh, usually the condition was given by, let's say, it's Kenson and uh, Brzezowski in 88, but the condition was on the product H0F. But actually, if you take into account nonlinear effect, the condition is more subtler, because actually we have the SAR that's proportional to H0F squared multiplied by some other contribution. That actually, well, this means that actually we can go a bit further. This is the main message. Uh, well, I have some a few minutes to spend on another another way or another manner to um, characterize. I mean, this um, specific absorption rate or to optimize, let's say, magnetic uh, the process of magnetic hypothermia, and this is uh, what's called let's say initial slope uh, uh, of temperature elevation. So the main question here is uh, we want to increase or let's say convert, of course, electromagnetic energy into heat. And this, is, uh, this will lead to an increase of uh, temperature in the, in the assembly. And this increase of temperature has to be controlled, of course, because there are also some limits on this. And to control this, you have to understand the dynamics of this, uh, uh, or let's say you have to understand the time profile of this temperature elevation. When you, uh, during the heating, I mean, the temperature increases, but you have to, to, to be careful and you have to control it. And uh, there are, there's a, I mean, there are, there's a, um, a slew of papers that deal with this uh, uh, initial slope. It's called initial slope um, determination of the star. The problem with it is that actually it is performed at some transient state of the sample. I mean, this is sample hasn't reached the thermodynamic equilibrium and it's not so easy to define the temperature actually. And it's also, uh, usually it ignores the heat flow from the sample into this particular uh, issue here, flow of the the, the heat from the sample into its environment, 
when it's the loss of this heat to the environment, one has to deal with, uh, let's say, the process of the, 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 the uh, heat transport in such a system. Now, the problem, as I said in my introduction, is this problem is not really solved yet. I mean, there are so many works uh, dealing with this because it's not clear how to extend, I mean, the well-known thermodynamic or diffusion equation in particular to the nanoscale system. Let's, uh, just to give you an idea of what we would like, what we're, what we're doing, we're trying to do in this respect, Let's, uh, I'm showing you, you here is a simple sketch of the, the sample. Let's say we have some nanoparticles embedded in some matrix, could be fluid here. Typically it could be magnemites or magnemites, magnetites as studied by Sha et al. and the Muras et al. and many other people. Uh, we, now the sample is constituted of uh, magnetic nanoparticles floating in a fluid and the container could be, I'm sorry, the environment can be the container or air. So what we would like to do is, I mean, to extend this uh, well-known equation with some time derivative, the temperature T, big T here. And this is the, the Laplacian that gives us the gradient of the change of the temperature with space. And this is the power, I mean, uh, the heat power. In our case, this part comes, is the source and this comes from the magnetic nanoparticles. Now, if you, you assume this is the, the main hypothesis that's because this equation is no easy to solve as you can imagine. So to be quick and to be short, if we consider that the relaxation time within the sample, I mean the diffusion of thermal uh, of heat within the sample, in this case, we can drop this term, which is the, the nasty term actually. And then we end up with uh, some with this equation that's called the heat balance equation, where a term that's added here, you know, you, you, you might know the, I mean, the Newton's law of cooling between two media and with a coefficient, here I call it L, and T of T is the, the temperature of the sample and this T zero, the temperature of the, the environment. So this is a well-known equation. So we can solve, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Now the question is, we can solve this equation. If we solve it, we will obtain the temperature as a function of time. This is what I, I called time profile of the temperature elevation. Now I'm not going into details. If you just say that these coefficients here are constant, they don't depend on temperature. In this case, there is a, a simple solution that shows you actually when you wait uh, for a uh, long enough time, you will end up with some steady state and the, 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 the temperature of the sample will be the same as the environment. This is some trivial, let's say, uh, solution. But now if you, sorry, just come back. If we remember that this is, this is the source that comes from magnetic nanoparticles subjected to an AC magnetic field. This is actually the SAR. This is what's uh, provided by uh, the conversion, let's say, of electromagnetic energy into heat by magnetic nanoparticles. So this quantity cannot be uh, temperature independent. It does depend on temperature. So quickly, the SAR, as I said before, it's uh, H squared, the frequency multiplied by the uh, outer phase component of the susceptibility. All right. And uh, these are the window, I mean, say notations, as I said before, eta is just omega multiplied by the fictive time. The fictive relaxation time here, one has to, to take into account the fact that the magnetization can rotate within the nanoparticle and the nanoparticle can rotate physically within the sample, if it's a ferrofluid, for example. And so you have to take into account of these two contributions. This is the, uh, just a component of the equilibrium, the simplest, let's say, uh, uh, part or contribution to the equilibrium uh, susceptibility without interactions, without anything complicated. And then if you, you, you can actually study this SAR, but this will be plugged. So please, I'm sorry, just uh, uh, pay attention with me. This G, I mean, this or S, whatever SAR, it's a function of temperature, applied field and frequency, and has to be plugged into this equation here Okay, the balance equation, which means that now we have a highly nonlinear equation for temperature as a function of time. 
I'm not going into details. Uh, uh, reduced temperature, this is a uh, reduced ele temperature elevation. This is temperature of the sample minus the temperature of the environment. And we have some simplifications here. We obtain an analytical equation. And uh, when we, we plot it, we have a, a good comparison between the analytical solution and the exact numerical solution for different applied fields and different frequencies. Now, just this is uh, comparison with experiments. Uh, these I just took some uh, data from uh, the result by Moraz. It's all published in 2011. So what we do, we have here the temperature rise in degrees Celsius as a function of time. And by fitting the experimental results, we can obtain this uh, a Newton's coefficient as a function of here the amplitude of the AC magnetic field, and here as a function of the um, the frequency of the and we do see, of course, that, I mean, this could be expected that the, uh, you know, the, the, this uh, temperature in, increases when you enhance or you increase the amplitude and frequency of the AC magnetic field. And I think uh, I still have one minute. Yeah, Sarah, I don't know. Yes, yes, you, you have- to Roughly, yeah. Yes, roughly. Uh, okay, so uh, let me just, um, say a word about this coefficient. The main idea here is, I'm sorry, I will go back to this equation. So what is this? The equation is here. This equation or the underlying hypothesis, as I said, uh, mainly says the following. We just, you know, that you inject some uh, electromagnetic energy via the AC magnetic field. So this energy goes into the nanoparticles. These nanoparticles are excited and they generate some uh, heat. Okay, this heat diffuses into the assembly. Then this there's uh, this uh, this heat goes also out of the the the, the um, let's say the, the sample into the environment. So there are two let's say three stages. Okay. And this equation just ignores the intermediary, uh, uh, let's say, stage, which is the diffusion within the assembly. This is assumed to be rather is fast. So, so what remains is the injection of energy or from the magnetic field and its loss towards the environment, right? But the question is how to, to characterize this coefficient and the, the, uh, the, the the plot of this data, or let's say the main objective behind this data is to, to trigger some, let's say, or to encourage some experiments, experimental groups to, 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 to go uh, and do and perform further experiments to characterize such a coefficient because it's uh, here it's used as a, a kind of phenomenological parameter. When we have, let's say, nanoparticles, spherical nanoparticles embedded in liquid, uh, there are several works that actually can compute this, uh, let's say, or, or obtain some analytical formula for this coefficient. But for the an assembly of magnetic nanoparticles, it's not so easy. It's really tough to, to, to develop some, uh, let's say, precise theory for this phenomenological parameter. But we need, so uh, that's why I'm insisting on this issue. We do need uh, experiments that will help develop, let's say, um, let's say more serious theory for um, uh, heat diffusion within the assembly and out of the assembly. And of course, there is also the, the problem of, uh, let's say, as I said, the second stage that has been actually, uh, let's say, uh, just ignored here, this question needs to be developed in, in the future. This is my conclusion, as I, 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 I hope I convinced you that the, there is a subtle play between the DC field and the uh, concentration uh, in the optimization of the SAR. So it's not uh, easy. I mean, it's not straightforward. You can just increase the DC field or the concentration to enhance the SAR. Uh, Nonlinear non effects, they also contribute to some extent because uh, I, I didn't say it, but uh, uh, our calculations are based on perturbation theory. So we cannot go, it's not an exact calculation, but it does show that actually this uh, physiological let's say a limit has to be re revisited in the in regards of um, nonlinear effects. Then time profile uh, of the magnetization that has been obtained here does actually uh, recover experimental results, but with the price to introduce some uh, kind of or similar 
coefficient to the Newton's coefficient of uh, uh, of cooling, and uh, we, we of course I would be happy to discuss with uh, experimental with our colleagues who do experiments on um, on uh, let's say magnetic or ferrofluids. It would be nice to study this uh, issue if uh, possible. And uh, as I said, we we still need to collaborate on this uh, on this issue. So it was to build. I mean, the main interest to me uh, here is to try to understand uh, in more precise terms and uh, I mean, the mechanisms of heat uh, conversion first and transport into and out of an assembly. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you, Hamid. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation, even for experimental uh, people. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about that for me. <laughs> No, no, but it's fine because you gave yeah, also nice. some ideas of how we can, uh, I mean, uh, interact and provide you some help in, uh, in, yeah. in finding uh, no, the, some, uh, the, the right uh, theory. Uh, so are there questions? Yes, from Antonio, Martin, please. Yes, thanks for the presentation. What's um, the dependence on the SARP with uh, the size of the particle? for example, from two to 10 and the shape. Yeah, well, the, the shape, we haven't tried that yet, but uh, I, I can comment on that. Uh, I mean, we have done some calculations for polydispersed assemblies because uh, the dependence on shape is subtle. I am sorry, on the size, because you know, uh, that, that was discussed by some guys, uh, I think the group of Ogradi and uh, collaborators, they have actually studied the, the size effect and they the, the 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 conclusion is there are three regimes for the size that like you have very small size intermediate size and the large sizes for small size you have the uh, this loss via the ac susceptibility then when you increase the size the particles become blocked okay in some minimum and then when you increase the magnetic field you can actually uh, induce some uh, loss or i mean heating via hyst uh, hysteresis, all right? And for much larger sizes, they call this, uh, the process is di different, is they call it magnetic steering, okay? So uh, if we just, uh, within what I have uh, presented, you just uh, stay in that regime, I mean, the size, as you know, will change the relaxation time. And this will change the response for sure, you see? And uh, then the, if we go back to the, let's say, AC susceptibility, the relaxation time is in the denominator, okay? So, which means that the, the, the I, I said before that for very small sizes, the equilibrium susceptibility dictates the behavior, right? But when you change, you increase the size, it will change the relaxation time. And in this case, the equilibrium susceptibility will but the role of equilibrium sensitivity will diminish. You know, you, you will start having the dynamics within the within the, the the well and out of the well that will start to play a role. But in this case, you 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 see uh, many people. Uh, I mean, there is another change, important change, and related with the relaxation time is that uh, when you have very small sizes, you can say your particles, most of them are really super paramagnetic. And in this case, the relaxation time is nails. The relaxation time is modeled by some erroneous uh, expression, all right? But, and this doesn't depend on the magnetic field, for example. But when, uh, you see, but then if you, you go beyond this approximation, which means that I mean, the relaxation time is modeled with some Aharoni uh, expression, I'm not going into details of brown, uh, relaxation time, this expression depends on the, mag on the DC magnetic field, which means this change in the energy barriers. And this, you see, so the response will be enhanced. This is what I'm... Uh, okay. The contribution, okay. the contribution of the dynamics will become more important. But okay. as I said, this is within the, uh, let's say the regime where the loss by AC susceptibility is dominant. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, this because sometimes, well, most of the cases, the particle is a core shell type particle. So you have yeah. 
a type of amorphous layer around the particle. So even if yep. you have a, a bigger particle, there's a part which will not contribute to, to the magnetic moment. Yeah, that's right. But you see, uh, the and I agree with you, but the problem, it's uh, it's not easy to, to take those details into account. But what you do usually, you say that actually if you have a dead shell, so the effective anisotropy is different. I mean, it has been reduced or uh, enhanced. It depends actually. But you, the anisotropy, for example, can change in nature and can change also in intensity. And mm -hmm. all these things will change the relaxation time. Okay. We have okay. we have actually published some work on, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the calculation of AC susceptibility, uh, taking into account cubic anisotropy mixed with uniaxial anisotropy. And uniaxial anisotropy can come from some effective, you know, for a core shell, but cubic can also come from the surface, as we as we discussed. And then, uh, believe me, <laughs> the equations become too complicated. Sure, sure. Okay, you can do numerically the calculations as many people. I didn't discuss, for yeah. example, the comparison between uh, the approach using AC susceptibility, but many groups use the hysteresis loop, for example. Yeah. They say that the star is proportional to the, to the area of the hysteresis loop. But this you can only do numerically. You don't have analytic, never. We can't compute. We don't know how to compute hysteresis loop analytically. I mean, you can you can say you don't care, but uh, I mean, if you want to understand the role of each uh, parameter, yeah. you need some analytical expressions. That's what. Yeah. Understand. That's Thank the main, main point. Actually. Okay, I stop you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, but it's fine. It's just we are a little bit out of time. But yeah. in any case, it was uh, so. I thank you, Amit, again, and oh, I, on much, behalf yeah. uh, of all the participants, I clap my hands to all the speakers uh, of uh, this session. Try half time in the and indeed, so people succeeded to attach, for instance, for instance, try to carbon nanotube, and they observed an increase of the apoptotic activity of try in cellulose, of course. Uh, also, they succeeded to attach tri to liposomes, metal oxide nanoparticles, metal nanoparticles. In all these cases, they observe an increase of the apoptotic activity. And also in vivo conditions, they observe an increase of the half lifetime of tri uh, when it was attached to some proteins or some polymeric particles. Uh, but in all these cases, the particles or the substrate uh, were considered as a um, passive carrier. I mean, uh, nobody uh, tried to, to use their physical chemical properties and to induce any some synergistic properties between the property of the substrate and the properties of triprotein. For instance, in the case of iron oxide nanoparticles, so there are several works about that, uh, the people succeeded to attach tri onto iron oxide nanoparticles, but they never uh, use this particle as uh, contrasting agent for MRI imaging, or as heating probe for magnetic hyperthermia, or as um, particle able to be moved by an external magnetic field for a magnetically assisted rock data. So in, also, uh, if we look uh, all these reports, several strategies were used to graft tie on the surface of the particles. Uh, some of them were based on covalent bonding using typically peptide coupling, attaching a carboxylic or an amino group of the tri to a, an amino or a carboxylic group at the surface of the particles. Others used physisorption and weak interaction like hydrogen bonding, and others used uh, electrostatic interaction. But in all these works, uh, nobody was interested on in the stability of the links between the particles and the tri particularly in biological media, and they didn't check the robustness of this uh, attachment. So in this context, we decided to prepare magnetic nanoparticles, namely iron oxide nanoparticles of different sizes, single core and multi-core, because we know that the magnetic properties are very dependent on the microstructure of the particles. We also decided to attach tri covalently to the particles, because covalent bonding is the robustness, is the most robust one, sorry, in uh, particularly in biological media. And also we wanted to apply an, an alternative magnetic field and to check if 
there is any synergetic effect between uh, magnetic heating induced by an alternative magnetic field and the apoptotic properties of trap. Okay, so let's start by the size effect. So using the polio process, we succeeded to produce highly crystallized single and multicore iron oxide particles. You can show here the EM images. Uh, so the polycrystalline particles were about 100 nanometers in size, while the single crystals were about 10 nanometers in size. And both uh, exhibit the spinel iron oxide structure, which you can see here, uh, with a chemical composition in, comprised between that of magnemite and that of magnetite. It's for that I, I wrote Fe3 minus XO4 as the chemical composition of our particles. Okay. We, as I told you previously, we attach APTS, amino propyl triethoxycylan, at the surface of the particles using sol gel chemistry, surface sol gel chemistry. So by this way, we succeeded to obtain uh, amino groups at the surface, and these amino groups were uh, reacted to carboxylic group from the tri protein using NHS EDC activation. And of course, we first confirmed the grafting. We used X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, as you can see here. Uh, I show you the survey spectra of bar particles, particles with ABTS, and particles with tri. And we foc I focus here on the nitrogen signal. And you can see that we have an increase of the signal intensity of nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon after grafting, confirming the grafting. Also, we decided to quantify the amount of tri attached to the particles. So we used several routes. We used, for instance, thermogravimetry analysis. So the weight loss uh, being uh, due to the high decomposition or departure from the surface of the particles under heating. We also use magnetometry measurements. Typically, we, we deduce the diamagnetic contribution of tri from the total magnetization of our particles. And we also use some biological assays called Bradford, Bradford assay, sorry, to quantify the amount of protein attached to the particles. And by this uh, route, we obtain that we have more or less 10 molecules at the surface of the particles, 10 nanometer in size, and around 10,000 molecules uh, at the surface of the particles of about 100 nanometer in size. Okay, so we started then the biological assays in, viv in vitro first, uh, and I will show you only in vitro assays. Uh, so for that, we decided to check the viability of tumor, tumoral human cells, in this case, colon cells, HCT116, provided from ATCC labs in US. And these viability assays are based on methylene blue assays, columbometric assays. So we can incubate it about 50,000 cells along 16 hours with different doses of tri free trial, bar nanoparticles, the two sizes and the produced nano hybrids using particles of 10 and 100 nanometer in size. And we plotted the viability cell ratio as a function of doses. And the dose were expressed as a function of tri amount in nanogram per milliliter. And you can see here in this plot, sorry, that bar nanoparticles here in black and yellow are almost. Uh, health, there is no lethal effect. However, free tie in green and our nano hybrid in red and blue induce an important cell death. And we determined from this, from this plot the lethal uh, tri doses, also called IC50. And we can see that we need about 1.5 nanogram per milliliter of uh, the nano hybrids but around 100 nanometer size of the particles and about five nanogram per milliliter for the, the nano hybrids built around 10 nanometer size of particles. While we need much more, 25 nanogram per milliliter of free tri. That means that we succeeded to concentrate tri at the surface of the particles and that by this way, we increased its uh, biolog biological activity. Also, we repeated this experience um, fixing the dose to the highest one, 10 micrograms per milliliter of tri, and we incubated uh, specific cells for 16 hours. These cells are the same than HCT116, but they were 5D receptor deficient. 
That means they haven't the receptor R1 or R2, so they are not able to be recognized by TRAP. And in this case, we did not observe any lethal effect. So this result is very important because it showed us that we need the trial targeting if we want to induce apoptosis in the cell. So I said apoptosis. I should, at this, at this stage, say only cell death. But anyway, we performed flow cytometry measurements after labeling our cells uh, by annexin-5 and propidium biodid. And uh, for that, we incubated about 10,000 cells along 16 hours with the high dose, 200 nanograms per milliliter. This dose, of course, is higher than the ICPC values to be sure that we have cell death. And we determined the apoptosis rate by plotting the percentage um, of um, uh, positively labeled cells against or ver versus negatively uh, labeled ones. And we can see here that for our nano hybrids, the 10 nanometer sizes and 100 nanometer sizes, we have more than 70% of cell death due to apoptosis. So really by this measurement, we can confirm that drafting try on the surface of particles allows the targeting with the tumoral cells and also an important cell death by apoptosis. Of course, we perform the same experiment with other tumoral cells, uh, hepatocellular ones, lung carcinoma, breast carcinoma. I showed you only a part of our results, but we obtained exactly the same results. Um, and what I want to highlight here is that the concentration of tri on the surface of particles particularly for the largest one. And in that case, we obtained, we had one, uh, sorry, 10,000 molecules at the surface. We are able to increase significantly the um, apoptotic properties of time. Okay. And then we decided to check if the coupling mode with the particles may, may affect the targeting with the receptor, high receptor. I mean, uh, I mean, we attached uh, on uh, the particles tri using always coupling, uh, peptide coupling, but in one case we use an amino group from the tri, and in another case we use a, a carboxylic group. For that, we decided to focus on the smallest in size particles, the 10 nanometer size of one. And for a part of our powders, we used APTES, amino propyl triethylphenyl, and then surface sol gel chemistry to attach amino group on their surface. And for the other part, we use citric acid. You can see here its formula. And we use surface complexation chemistry in order to attach carboxylic group at the surface of the particles. And these two modified particles were then coupled through uh, EDC NHS uh, peptide activation to uh, try using, in one case, carboxylic group, and in another case, an amino group. We confirmed the grafting using, once again, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. And you can see that in both cases, we have an increase of carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen uh, signal intensity, meaning that we succeeded the grafting. And then we performed the quantification of TRI using, once again, thermogravimetry analysis, a magnetometry, and Bradford assay. And we obtained almost 10 molecules per particles for both cases. Uh, for for the particles modified by carboxylic group and particles modified by amino group. Very interesting. And then we tested the biological activity of these nano hybrids using, in this case, human lung carcinoma cells, also provided from ATCC uh, labs in the US. We also used the methylene blue assays. And the idea is to incubate these cells along 16 hours with different doses of bar particles free, high, and our nano hybrids. And we plotted, I, sorry, I hope that you can see the plot. We plotted the cell viability ratio as a function of the tri doses for all the systems. And you can see that once again, we have a much more uh, biological uh, effect uh, when tri is attached to our particles with an IC50 value, the half lethal uh, tri doses significantly smaller than that of free tri, 
three, six nanograms per milliliter compared to 20 nanograms per milliliter. And also using flow cytometry after annexin 5 and propidium iodide uh, labeling, we can clearly see that we have much more, uh, I mean, the cell death is much, much more due to apoptosis. About 70% of the cell death uh, was due to apoptosis, much more higher than try alone. Okay. Uh, so at this stage, we said, okay, we are sure that TRI is still active when we attach it through a carboxylic group or through an amino group, but we wanted to see if there's uh, grafting uh, can uh, perturb the TRI with its receptor recognition. So for that, we started by constructing TRI uh, protein using the protein structure data bank. So you can see it here. And then we model using uh, molecular dynamic the interaction between TRI and um, the depth, the, the specific domain in the receptor which is attached to the TRI. This is called the DR4 domain or fragment. And when we did that, we observed that we have still peripheric carboxylic groups and amino groups, typically glutamic acid 4 and methionine 1, which are from the recognition seeds and which can be used for the attachment of the particles or, or of try to the particles without, we hope, affecting the uh, modeling, the, sorry, the, inter the recognition interaction. Okay, so we attach particles of 10 nanometer in size to these uh, groups, the glut glutamic acid and the methionine, glutamic acid 4 and methionine 1. And we uh, modeled again the interaction between TRI and uh, the, the fragment of the receptor, which is in interaction with TRI. And we observed that there is no effect and the recognition takes place very well. So we are very happy because we confirm that TRI is still active, even if we attach it through a glutamic acid or a methionine group from its peripheric uh, group. And we obtain, uh, once again, an increase of the biological activity of TRI, thanks to the concentration of these molecules, these proteins at the surface of small particles. Okay. Of course, we obtain the same results, uh, replacing uh, these uh, human malignant cells, H1703, by hepatocellular or tumoral colon cells, and also breast cells. So that means these results are equivalent. And then we decided to apply an alternative magnetic field and to, to see if we have any uh, effect to this magnetic alternative field uh, when TRI is present. So for that, we focused on the largest in size particles because they exhibit the, high, they exhibit the highest magnetization. And you know that uh, for uh, an effective uh, magnetic heating, we need a high magnetization. And we attach uh, try to these uh, particles using the same strategy. I mean, solar chemistry uh, for uh, APTUS region. Okay, so you know that by this uh, coupling uh, process, we have about 10,000 molecules protein at the surface of the particles, of each particle. We, I plotted here the magnetization as a function of the magnetic field of our bar nanoparticles and the nano hybrids at 37 degrees C. And we started by uh, checking the capability of these particles and there's nano hybrid to heat in or just water. So we, we use a commercial setup, uh, nanoscale biomagnetics. We applied a magnetic alternative field of uh, about 180 goes in magnitude and 471 kilohertz in frequency uh, along 500 seconds. And we follow the temperature increase as a function of time for bar nanoparticles and our nano hybrids. And we, uh, perform these measurements for different doses. Here we express the, the particle doses as an iron concentration. You have to know that um, typically four millimolar of iron correspond to 10 nanograms per milliliter of track. And we observe that concentration of iron higher than 12 millimolar 
which correspond to about 30 nanogram per milliliter of tri, we obtain a heating uh, of about 41, 43 degrees C, which is supposed to be high enough to induce uh, cell death. And this increase is quite equivalent. You can see the plots uh, here for both the bar particles and the nano hybrid one. We determine the specific absorption rate using the slope uh, of T as a function of temp the temperature as a function of time uh, curves. And we obtain almost the same value suggesting that the tri coating has no effect on the heating. So uh, we obtain a value around 100 watt per gram of iron. Okay. We performed once again the same experiment, but in this case, we introduced um, uh, human breast carcinoma cells, MDA MD231, also provided from ATCC lab. And we also observe the same increase for the same iron uh, concentration. I mean, uh, 12 millimolar, we have about 41, 43 degrees C along 500 seconds of uh, magnetic field application for both. Uh, bar particles and our nano hybrids, and you observe the same heating even on tri receptor deficient cells. That means in this case, we haven't the, the recognition between tri and its receptor. Okay. Uh, we then perform viability assays uh, on the same cells, human breast carcinoma cells, using a methyl and blue assay. So the idea is to incubate the cells along 16 hours at 37 degrees C with different doses of uh, particles, bar particles and uh, nano vector. I show you here the result only for uh, those corresponding to 12 millimolar of iron. I focus on this concentration because we know from the previous results that at this concentration, we have a, a heating up to 41, 43 degrees C. Uh, if we apply an alternative magnetic field. So in green, you have the cell death ratio after 16 hours of incubation without the application of an, alter an alternative magnetic field. And we repeat this experiment um, by applying along 500 seconds, which corresponds to more or less eight minutes of an alternative magnetic field, the same than previously, and incubating after the cells along 16 hours. And you can see clearly that with our nano vectors, nano hybrids, sorry, we obtain the highest cell death. And this cell death, it's much more important uh, when we apply an alternative magnetic field and much more important compared to bar nanoparticles, even if we apply a magnetic field. Uh, similarly, we perform the same experiment uh, using, in this case, uh, tri receptor deficient cell, they are called the DKO. When you see this abbreviation, DKO, that means that you haven't receptor at the surface, at the, on the cell membrane, uh, tri receptor on the cell membrane. And in this case, you can see here, we have a very, very small cell death, suggesting that even if we have a heating, because we know that we can have a heating, the cell death is very small, less than 20% compared to uh, um, more than 80% when we combine both tri to the particles and to the application of magnetic field. So clearly, tri targeting play an important role in the cell death, and uh, magnetic heating is not is not able alone to kill significantly these malignant cells. So our our idea is that when tri is um, attached to its receptor. So the trans cross is attached to the particles, to the magnetic particles. So when we apply the magnetic field, we have Brownian um, motion. That means the particles can move, but they are attached to the cell membrane. So they can break, break the, the cell membrane and we lose the membrane integrity and the cell dead. And or also, these particles, when we apply the magnetic field, may heat, and the proximity of the particle to the cell membrane make this heating uh, high enough to induce uh, cell membrane fluidification. And once again, uh, membrane loss of the cell membrane integrity and the cell death. So I'm thinking that the, the, heat, the heating affects the cell death by this way. Uh, I, no, I can't say the heating. I should say the application of an alternative magnetic field, because in the first case, it's much more a mechanical effect than a heating effect. So 
So then TM observation are in progress in order to confirm this our hypothesis. Sorry, sorry Swad, to interrupt you. Sorry, can you hear me? You have two minutes more. Can you? It's possible. Okay, it's the last. It's the last slide. Okay. Okay. Great. So just to conclude, uh, we obtained the same result with other malignant cells, uh, human cells, and the main message is that uh, high targeting is very very important if we want to induce cell death, even by applying magnetic interference. So before to stop, I just want to acknowledge some colleagues who helped us for some technical assistance and for thoughtful advices, and also our sponsor, the funding agency. And I stop now, and many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mar, for this very interesting uh, talk. So I can start with one question. So uh, maybe I missed some points. So because it's not, not really confident with this um, uh, topic. But just to know, so uh, this kind of uh, particles, you know, that you that are functionalized with these um, uh, molecules, okay. has also some effect on healthy cells or not? No, this is interesting. Uh, this is well known. Thai protein has no effect on healthy cells. I, I haven't the slide here because we performed the same measurement on healthy uh, breast or lung or exactly. hepatic cells, and we didn't observe nothing um, using okay. our particles or our nano -emitter. Nothing, no, it's a big word. We didn't observe um, an important cell death. Okay. So really the tri targeting is very important okay. and it is specific to tumoral cells. And this, is a, this is a very good point. Okay, so mm -hmm. thank you very much. So we have time for one more question, if any. Okay, if not, let's thank again the speaker and then uh, we you. can, yeah, welcome. And then we can move to the uh, second uh, invited speaker, uh, Professor uh, Noges uh, from uh, the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology of Spain. Uh, so, Professor Noges is a, a leader scientist in the field of nanomagnetism and, of course, nanostructural magnetic materials for both uh, uh, fundamental studies and different uh, applications. So, uh, Professor Noges already shared the screen. So, then I leave uh, the floor uh, to him, who will give a talk titled uh, Iron If. Iron 304 nanocubes as a ver versatile terranostic agent. So please, no guess. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gaspar, uh, for the introduction. And thank you also to the organizers for inviting me to present our work. As Gaspar said, I'm going to, to tell you about uh, uh, um, magnetite nanocubes as terranostic agents. As you all know, uh, magnetic iron oxide has been used for cancer, cancer diagnosis and therapy, like a, for like um, as MRI agent or magnetic particle imaging, and also for drug delivery, as, as for example, as, uh, because you can you can uh, you can move the particles using magnetic fields, and also you can you can uh, selectively release the drugs using magnetic fields, and also as as uh, as we have just heard, we can we can um, do localized hypertermia using therapy, but not only using alternative magnetic fields, but also I will as I will show you, you can use uh, iron oxide as for hypertermia using near infrared light. Well, how does how does this work in the real world? Well, you may have heard there is commercial MRI contrast agents um, using F304. And actually, magnetic hyperthermia has been used in human, but uh, not everything is perfect in the real world. And actually, the uh, contrast agents using F4 have been discontinued. And actually, for for uh, the clinical trials, the the doses that are used are really large. So how to, how to how can we improve the the properties of the nanoparticles that can be, can be used in, in the real world. One way to do it is doping with cobalt. 
which improves the magnetic properties of the nanoparticles. And the other one, another possible way to improve is combining optical and magnetic heating, which is usually done uh, adding a, a plasmonic particle to the, to the magnetic particle. Uh, what's the problem? Uh, uh, cobalt dope nanoparticles are not approved to be used in humans. So that, that puts a lot of limits. And also gold is the only plasmonic material that can be used in humans. And its combination with iron oxide is quite complex because they have very different structures. So creating coarsial nanoparticles, for example, or dimers is not trivial. So another, another way to tune the magnetic properties is to tune the shape. Uh, so far, the most of the of the studies have been carried out in spherical nanoparticles. So tuning the shape can also improve the properties. And what we are going to tell you about today are cubic nanoparticles. But most of the synthesis of cubic nanoparticles has been carried out using either iron oleate or iron acetonate as precursors. However, both systems have drawbacks. Uh, when we use iron oleate, this is a, a, a two-step process where you first create a, an iron precursor and then you mix it with a, a oleate. And um, using this approach, it's difficult to have particles larger than 20 nanometers. And it's actually when you use this approach, the core is prone to be FEO. We show here an example of, of a crucial nanoparticle using as iron oleate, where the coal is FEO and the shell is fe 304 and when you use iron acetyl acetonate, it is difficult to grow small particles in this case. And it's actually the, the, this approach is prone, prone to shape homogeneity and broad particle size distribution. Here I show you an example where you have many different types of particles when using uh, iron acetonate. So what I'm going to tell you today is a new synthesis pathway based on iron acetyl acetonate. Since, since the suitability of nanoparticles for applications depends both on the crystallinity and the shape, our, our objective is to find a synthesis method that fulfills the following criteria. That the size monospheres, and they have low aggregation, they, they have a, a pure iron oxide phase, oops, sorry. And they have crash crystallinity and they, they have controllable size and well-defined shape. And what's the main problem of the synthesis using iron acetyl acetonate? Is that uh, the, the solvent which is used in the synthesis, which is given see letter, is actually unstable at high temperatures. And this makes that while you're synthesizing the particles, the boiling point of the reaction changes with time. We show you here a synthesis using given see letter, and you see that the that the, the boiling point is, is changing, changing with time. This is the origin of the, the size polydispersity and the shape polydispersity. So what we did is to mix the dividend cell letter with oxazine at, and tetraazine. And the result of this was to stabilize the boiling point of the solution. And this leads to a better control of the, of the particle synthesis. And can we get cubic nanoparticles? Yes, we can. You can see here, we have a, a rather, these are a, a 15 nanometers and with a rather narrow particle size distribution. They are highly crystalline and very homogeneous. And uh, how do we know they are uh, fe 304 uh, We did a, a few, a few uh, experiments. First, the, the Saturation magnetization is reasonably high, 84 mu gram for a 15 nanometer nanoparticle. The, they, the particles show a Burbay transition, which only fe 304 shows and not fe 203 for example. They also show a typical peak at a 18 degrees, which uh, um, fe 203 does not show. And also we did energy loss uh, spectroscopy. Here I show you the iron, iron edge of the, of, the, of the energy loss. And then we did the mapping using the ratio of these, of these two peaks 
you get the oxidation state. And I show, show here the mapping, and you see that the particles have a very, very uh, constant oxidation state at about uh, 2.6, which is what we expect from uh, FE304. So indeed, all the all the criterion tools confirm us that we do have FE304. And can we control the size? Well, yes. First, we did we did that using a standard technique, which is changing the amount of uh, iron acetyl acetonate. As you see, when we put more more iron acetyl acetonate, we can get larger particles. The second approach we tried was to uh, usually when we synthesize before we start the synthesis, we do uh, we degas the sample using a vacuum. And depending on at what time we do this vacuum, we can get different sizes. As you show here, if the vacuum is uh, the vacuum step is performed at 100 C, we get small particles. But if if we we just pump the the system at room temperature, we can get reasonably large particles. And also another approach we did is to play with the with the, with the heating rate and actually the the amount of um, of total sample sorry of total sample. And you see that by controlling the the synthesis parameter, we can get quick particles with very narrow particle distribution over large particle sizes, ranging from 10 nanometers to 90 nanometers. So to, to, to convince ourselves that we had cubic particles, we made up a, a, a cubicity index, so to say, where, where we divide the, the diagonal of the particles by the square root of the edge. If you have a cube, this number should be 100%. If you have a sphere, it should be 70%. If you have an octahedron, it should be 50%. And you see that, that our particles have very close to 100% from the very smallest ones up to the largest ones. So meaning that they are all nice cubes. And also, uh, we, we calculated the polydispersity index, which is standard deviation divided by the particle size. And you see that, that uh, the polyspersic index is below 10% for almost all, all the particles, except the largest ones. So as I said, we have a narrow particle distribution and good cubicity in the narrow particles in the whole size range. And then what we did is to, to transfer them to water and see if they were stable with time. This, this here is, uh, just after the, we have transferred the water and they are, they are uh, colloidally stable at, at the, just after they, they have been transferred to water. However, when we wait a few days, you see that the samples with the largest nanoparticles precipitate to here, but the, the, the samples with 16 nanometers or less, they are colloidally stable even after three days. To, to, to see the origin of this effect, we, we did uh, DLS measurements, and we see that the, that the small particles, the, the, um, the hydrodynamic ratio divided by the, the TM size is, is equal to, to one. So meaning that the, the hydrodynamic ratio and the, and the size is the same, meaning that they are, they are um, yeah, separated. However, as they become larger, this, this, the ratio increases here, meaning that as they are 17 or larger, they start to aggregate. And as they become larger and larger, they become aggregate more and more. And then we did some magnetic measurements and we see that, that the coercivity of the, of, the, of the small particles is zero as we expect. You can see here the black, the black core, meaning that they're super paramagnetic. And as, as the size increases, the coercivity starts increasing. So the, the, the particles aggregate and they, they are no longer super magnetic. So when the, as the particles become ferromagnetic, they lose their colloidal stability. So then we did some, uh, some um, nuclear magnetic resonance experiments on these particles. 
and we see that that uh, at 13 nanometers uh, R2 value is 330, but when we increase just two nanometers, this value increases from 330 to 455. And if we increase if we increase further to 19 nanometers, the change is very small. And here is a transition from from uh, these these samples are colloidally stable, while these ones eventually precipitate. So just just uh, going from 13 to 15, we get a big improvement in the in the NMR properties, but increasing further further to 19 does not increase the particle the, the properties. And I wanted to mention that the commercial efficacy of four products have a R2 values in the range of 100 to 200, meaning that we have more than double the commercial, the commercial properties. So as I said, we have a big improvement from 13 to 15, but just a small increase from 15 to 18 nanometers. So since, since the 18 nanometers tend to agglomerate, 15 nanometers we would prefer for, for biomedical applications. And then we did some, uh, some uh, magnetic hyperthermia measurements. We use a, a AC field of 213 OS at a frequency of 183 kilohertz. And these, these are conditions which are lower than the, than the 5 cent to 9 limit proposed. And here we have a similar, similar effect. We see as we increase two nanometers in size, the, the, the magnetic heating improves considerably. While if we, if we increase four nanometers, the, the, the improvement is only moderate. So, so similar to, to the NMR results, uh, would, uh, 15 nanometers would be preferable for biomedical applications because the properties are rather good and they are not, they do not agglomerate. And if we compare, we compare the SAR values with commercial um, spherical particles, these are much smaller, less than half of the of um, the ones we obtain with the cubic nano, nanoparticle. But as I mentioned before, FE304 can can also be used uh, using using infrared light. Usually, usually optical hyperthermia or what's called phototermia is done in, in uh, using plasmonic materials or highly absorbing materials like carbon based uh, materials or organic dyes. And why do we want to use uh, near infrared light? This is because at this this range about from eight, about 700 to 1300 or so, the the water or and the tissues in the body absorb the least amount of of uh, energy, so that means that the light can penetrate much deeper using this this uh, near infrared region. This region here. So uh, what we did is to 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 do experiments at 808, which is in this area, which is what's called the first biological window, and in this area at 1064 which is within the second um, biological window. And what we do is to shine, shine the last laser here with uh, our liquid with a nanoparticle and with an infrared thermometer, we measure the temperature. So, and here we use only 0 0.2 milligrams per milliliter to do the experiments and a power of 0 0.1 bars per uh, square centimeter. So it must be emphasized that that the limit exposure limit for laser for for the skin is about 8.33 bats per square centimeter for 188 and one bat per square centimeter for 1064 nanometers so we are far below the the limit we could use and we indeed see that when we shine the laser laser the temperature increases both using both lasers but we see that that using the 164 nanometers laser, we, we reach much, much higher temperature than the 804. And if we look at the absorption of the FE304 nanoparticle, we see that actually 808, the absorption has a minimum, while at higher, at higher um, 
wavelengths, there is an increase of absorption again. And this is, this is what's uh, giving us the better, better properties at the second biological window. And actually, uh, if we compare um, the magnetic hyperthermia and the optical hyperthermia, optical hyperthermia is far more effective than the magnetic hyperthermia. The only drawback is that the light only penetrates, penetrates uh, a limited amount inside the skin. And actually, as I said, uh, 164 is better than 108 to use as a laser to, uh, for laser heating. And then, since the no cubes are both magnetically and optically anisotropic, we, we did uh, um, we use this, this property for local temperature sensing. What we did, the show here, is we, we had a, a container with the nanoparticles, and we put an AC field here. And this AC field makes the nanoparticles rotate. And since the absorption is not the same, in all directions, this makes that when we measure the absorption, the absorption changes with time also. And, and actually since, since, uh, since the absorption in this direction and this direction is the same, the optical response has a, has a, a double frequency than the magnetic uh, applied field. And also there is another effect, which is the optical response usually has a phase lag to the uh, magnetic field. This is because of the, of the drag of the nanoparticles inside the liquid. And this phase, phase lag is due to the viscosity. And since viscosity depends on temperature, by measuring this phase lag, we can measure temperature. And here I show you, I show you an example. We, we put the nanoparticles in cell media and we apply the AC field. And here I, in, in red, I show you the phase lag, which uh, the difference between the, the, uh, the, the absorption and the magnetic field. And in black, I show you the, uh, the temperature we measure using different red thermometer. You see that there is a very nice correspondence uh, between both measurements. This means that we can use the nanoparticles uh, to measure magnetic optically in situ in real time to, to detect temperature inside, inside the cell media. Which actually the infrared thermometer only measures the surface. So using this approach, we measure the inside of the cell media. So in conclusion, I hope I have convinced you that we, we can synthesize FHCO4 nanocubes in broad size range here, say, range of sizes with a good shape control, with a good particle size distribution and with good colloidal stability. And the nanoparticles exhibit excellent MRI relaxivity values, good, good magnetic hyperthermia response, uh, especially for pure iron oxide particles, and good phototermal behavior in the near infrared. And we can use these nanoparticles also for in situ temperature sensing. So this means that the FTO for nanocubes have a great potential as versatile uh, diagnostic agents. So to finish, I'll, I'll mention my collaborators. This is done in my group with, and with collaboration with uh, Alberto Lopez in uh, Universidad Pública Navarra, uh, Elvira Fantecchi, uh, Francesco Pineder, and Claudio San Gregorio and Pisa and Firenze and, and a group of uh, Professor Pedro and University of Barcelona. And I also mentioned uh, my, my sponsors. So thank you for your attention. Okay. So thank you very much, Professor Norges, for this very interesting talk about uh, Aaron three or four uh, particles for biomedical and theranostic applications. So uh, the paper is open for question. Already uh, there is a question from uh, uh, Ricardo. So Ricardo, please. So thank you very nice talk. Um, I, have, I have a question concerning the in-situ temperature sensing, last part of your talk. So I clearly understand the fact that this cause depends on temperature, so that if you measure the phase lag, you can correlate this to the temperature. But my question is about the calibration. 
because I mentioned that everything is strongly dependent on the size of, of, of the particle. So the question is, how do you calibrate or say your thermometer in practice? Because I think that you should have a, a very, very strict control on the size and dispersion of particles in order to get a good calibration for sensing. Uh, does it make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, what we do is to, is to calibrate using a, 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 the cell media, using a Peltier and using the infrared thermometer very slowly. So this here, this is, well, it's not fast, but this is really fast. But there we, we, can, we can change the temperature very slowly. So then the, the infrared thermometer and the, and the nanoparticles measure exactly the same temperature. Yeah, I see. Because, Thank because you. The, because the problem, if we when you do it fast, then the infrared thermometer only measures the surface, and and the, the heat can cannot reach the surface at the same speed as it heat inside. So that's that's why the the nanoparticles are more accurate in measuring the inside of the of the cell media. But, but first we calibrate it. We calibrate it using like a slow a slow Peltier measurements. Thank you. Okay, so are there any other questions? So I have one, but I probably missed this information, but uh, why, so if I will understood that cubic particles show better properties than uh, spherical particles. Mm -hmm. So the question is why? Probably you, you said it in the talk, but I missed the, maybe this No, I, I, I didn't mention why, I mentioned they do. It's a, uh, okay. It's a, the, there is but a, do you have an idea a, why? There is, there is many articles that mention that cubic particles have better than okay. similar particles which are spherical. I okay. believe it's a it's an issue of the of the anisotropy given by the cubic shape. Okay. But but I don't think there is a a careful study about this. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, there is one more question. Please, uh, Antonio Martit. Concerning this uh, question and response you give, uh, it's not a question of surface, because in the case of, of uh, cubic particles of about the same diameter of a spherical one, you have a higher surface to transmit the heat. Yeah, but, but it's, not only, it's not only the magnetic hyperthermia that improves, it's many other properties that improve. So I think it's indeed related to the surface, which the cubic particles have higher surface to volume ratio. Yeah. But to the surface anisotropy, probably. Okay. Not okay. only not only the surface. Okay. So we have time for one more question, if any. Okay. If yes, there is. Dino, please. <laughs> So Joseph, um, mm -hmm. very nice talk, but very interesting. So it, from the TM images, it is clear that uh, the particles are quite close to each other, and then interparticle interactions do exist. Mm -hmm. So if the particles are, are, are big, the interaction will be so strong that uh, you will have uh, agglomerates, as, as you, you showed. I'm thinking about the possibility, and uh, I, I don't know if you checked this, to control the um, practice, the concentration of particles, and then uh, the interparticle uh, distance in order to have uh, a compromise. I mean, uh, no agglomeration uh, for quite big particles, but uh, high moments. Of course, the, the amount of particle should de decrease. So the, 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 the idea is to try to, to use quite big particle that, particles that normally should be ferromagnetically and then uh, not interesting, but at a sufficiently large distance in order to benefit of the high moment of such particles and then to find the compromise. What do you think about? Yeah, I think it should be possible. But uh, the, the issue here is that you have to put, to put um, something, some shell, some organic shell or something to, to be able to separate them more. Yeah, yeah. This may interfere later 
with with your heating because maybe maybe if you put a very large large uh, organic shell which actually we have tried to put larger shell, well, larger organic organic uh, surfactants and things like this on surface and that that usually has a, a detrimental effect on the on the heating but we uh, i don't know how much because we ne never did a, a systematic study but yeah, yeah. okay but for example i know people have used silicon oxide shells and and grow different sizes and see how it affects the hyperthermia and and for larger uh, silicon oxide shells yeah. the hyperthermia gets worse we we don't use uh, we just used organic organic uh, shells and and i don't know how much that would would affect the, the heating that we never tried yeah okay thanks uh okay uh, is there any, one more question from antonio no it's oh, yes. just just one one cur cur uh, curiosity because i never saw uh electronic microscopy picture of a real cube did you see this somewhere because uh, we we look at this you, you we, we mean no this is a square it's not a cube but uh i never saw this picture uh, do you know if it is yeah exists? i don't think i i can i have it but i don't I don't think I can find it easily. I don't have it in my presentation. We did we did uh, tomography reconstruction of the nanoparticle. Mm -hmm. This is a core shell nanoparticle, but the idea is the same. We've done the same with non core shell. Oh, you see really here, nice. you see here the the tomography reconstruction of a cubic nanoparticle. Oh, very if you can share with us the, the publication, it should be nice. Send yeah, okay, the... I can send you the. the Thank you very much. Okay, uh, may, maybe there is, no, just, no. Uh, so I think uh, so that we have to stop here. And thank you again, uh, Professor Nogues for this very nice talk. So now we can move to the yeah. last, uh, you're welcome. You're welcome, Joseph, thank you very much. So, okay, now we can move to the last uh, invited speaker, which is, uh, who is Professor uh, Ricardo Bertacco from the Politecnico of Milano. So Ricardo is prof full professor at the university and is a leading expert in spintronics, nanoelectronics, and also of application of magnetism in biology and medicine. And today he will give a, a talk about uh, uh, a labo chip device for uh, testing uh, malaria. So uh, I give the floor uh, to uh, Ricardo. So please, Ricardo. Okay, you already shared the screen. Okay, great. <laughs> so you can start, please. Okay, thank you, Gaspar, for your kind introduction, for inviting me to give this contribution to, to this conference. So this is somehow an update about the late, last development of this technology that we are developing for testing malaria. So uh, just to okay, move to the outlook, I'll just uh, summarize the, the concept of this diagnostic test. I will describe the first prototype application and the, the first on-field validation that we did two years ago in Africa. And then I will move towards the new frontier, which is the digital detection of single cells infected by a plasmodium, which is what we call digital cell detection. And then that, the conclusion. I'll say, I think that everybody knows the problem of malaria worldwide. Now we are always all concerned with uh, by the COVID, but hey, we should not forget that every year in the world that there is a, I'll say, a great number of people dying from malaria. So, so uh, there is a little bit of confusion these days because uh, probably we have this virus which is affecting everybody, but in the past probably we didn't pay attention enough to what was happening, I'll say, for many many people, say, in other countries. Anyway, I'll say that's a problem, and the problem is something which is due not to a virus. It's a, it's a, a parasite, which is a plasmodium, which lives uh, part or half of its life inside the human body. And uh, the other half is inside the mosquito, which is the anopheles. And what happens inside, which is, I'll say, what is connecting this uh, parasite with magnetism, that during, I'll say, the intraeritocytic uh, uh, phase, which is, I'll say, uh, the part of the life which takes place inside the red blood cells, the parasite feeds on hemoglobin and transforms it into a mosaic, which is this very nice uh, crystal that you see here. 
They are nanometric crystals made of this emodulin, which is chemically beta amatin. Okay. And the interesting story is that this is called the malaria pigment because it's used to identify so also the states in the sense that the agglomeration of these uh, emodulin crystal inside the cell gives rise to these specific shapes, the ring shape that you see here, which is that appearing at the early stage of the infection. And when you see the trophozoite and the schizon, which is the stage at which uh, the internal pressure of the cell is so high that there will be a rupture of the membrane. And, and that's the stage at which you have the fever attack for the patient. Now, the interesting story is that I'll say there are also other interesting stages like the gametocyte, which is the final, the end stage, uh, which is, I'll say, not, I'll say, um, this is no more, I'll say, um, uh, symptomatic of an infection. So it is the last stage, but this is the sexual stage, which is that essential for the transmission. So it's also interesting to disentangle, I'll uh, say, the, the, I'll say, the asexual stage, which are, I'll say, concerning this uh, round cycle here and the gametocytes. Now, what about the connection to magnetism? The interesting story is the, is that, I'll say, these crystals are magnetic and try to figure out a possible method for using this, I'll say, non-synthetic nanoparticle, but I'll say biological nanoparticle to identify malaria. Just a, a, summer, um, I'll say, a summary of the available diagnostic tool, just to compare our technology with the available one. So the gold standard is a direct microscopy analysis, which is done by expert microscopists, but it takes time and it's, so it's really operator dependent. Rapid diagnostic tests are based on lateral flow devices. And they are, I'll say, very, I'll say, cost effective, but I'll say, uh, they suffer from the poor sensitivity. The limit of detection is on the order of 200 per site per microliter. It, and also they suffer from a high number of false positive. And it's not quantitative. That's something which is also very relevant in the sense that it's yes or no. It's not or something telling you which is the concentration. And also, I'll say the last frontier is that of PCR. Uh, I'll say isothermal PCR like the lamp which is now under development by many, uh, by many, I'll say, groups in the world. And that could be very interesting, but so far there is not a real exploitation in the field, I'll say, which means, I'll say, uh, very close to the patient in the small village. So what we did was to, to figure out what you could do using the magnetic properties of the mosaic crystals, which are due to the fact that due to the uh, transformation which happens in infected red blood cells, so um, this transformation creates mosaic with the change of the uh, valence states of the iron, which is contained in the, I'll say, in, in this molecule here, which is essentially the hemin, so that you are you have transition to I spin states, iron three plus, which means that you are dealing with the paramagnetic material. So the susceptibility is very, very tiny. So uh, for infected red blood cell, you are on the order of uh, 10 to the minus six, uh, uh, which is the delta key with respect to the water, and which is not, not very good if you think that for standard nanoparticles like the nanocube, you have susceptibility on the order of 1 or 0 0.1, which means a, a 5, 10, 5, 6 order of magnitude less. But okay, nevertheless, they are different from so, uh, for healthy red blood cell and then can be disentangled. Uh, another interesting point is when um, is that when you move to, uh, I'll say, to the um, pure remodeling crystals, so you, since it, I'll, say, I'll say the susceptibility is on the order of four by 10 to the minus four, which means it's higher, but okay, they are small. So that's in this talk, I will just discuss the capture and uh, the analysis of the infected red blood cell. And here you see the different stages that you can have for the different species of plasmodium. Now, uh, at the very beginning, I'll say we tried to figure out which were the, uh, the physical properties of these nanocrystals, and we discovered that they are insulating particles, both in DC and also at high frequency. This was a measurement uh, carried out by uh, AFM, conductive AFM, showing that on top of the mosaic crystal, so there is a low current with respect to what you measure on the substrate of gold. And was a good news because, in principle, our detection method is based on impedimetric uh, detection.
which means we fabricate a chip on which we have some electrodes. And the story is that we exploit now the ma magnetic attraction in order to concentrate infected rebel cells just on top of the electrodes on which we want to, to measure now the presence of the cell because the presence of the cell will cause an increase of the impedance which is me measured by this electrode. So we typically work in this vertical configuration in which we have our sample, which is loaded in our cartridge with the cell, which is defined by the microchip on one side and glass slide on the other side. The spacing here is on the order of um, 400 microns. And then uh, we just exploit the gravity uh, and the competition between gravity and magnetic force so that uh, all the red blood cells are falling down due to gravity, but only the infected ones are captured towards the electrodes. And then we measure the signal. So that's essentially the story that you see as some of some of the of the particles, which means the alpha red blood cells fall down and the other are captured. And here you see the eye magnetic field gradient that we must provide by a uh, suitable configuration. So the gradient of H squared is in the order of 10 to 13, 10 to 14 uh, amps squared uh, per meter cube. And obviously we use uh, the concentrator with, with a double concentrator, uh, concentrating strategy, which is with using external magnet and also micromagnets fabricated on the chip. So this is what is happening. You see these are trajectory simulated. So uh, all uh, red blood cells, the infected red blood cells are falling down. They are attracted towards also the chip due to the external uh, magnets uh, gradient. But in proximity to the, to the surface, you see this the small micromagnets which are concentrating on say the, the, uh, the, the particles. And this is the signal that you measure at one megahertz, so that we are not really uh, sensing what is um, the internal content of the cell. We are just measuring the fact that you have a cell membrane at this frequency typically. And you see that after capture, there is I'll say a change in the current. The current is decreasing, and this decrease is due to the fact that you are putting in between the electrodes something which is less conducting than, I'll say, the, the plasma that you have in the blood. That's, I'll say, the concept. And this is a video showing uh, how, how the first prototype was, uh, was designed. This was, is the cartridge. The chip is loaded here. You load the sample here, and, and then you close the cartridge. You create the electrical context. You insert it into, uh, into the region. And then you see here the magnets, the external magnets. They approach, and then you see exactly what happens. This is a, a, a signal which is partially due to some drift, but the, uh, at some point you release the magnet and only in case of a malaria affected patient, you see this jump, which is connected to the fact that there was a capture, which was really a capture. And then you see this dynamics. But okay, uh, this was used in practice for say some, uh, some, con some experiments, first in Italy at Saka Hospital, which is now one of the uh, most active uh, hospital in Italy for the COVID. And the same group, we were uh, first analyzing negative controls, healthy donors showing no jumps at the point of the movement of the magnets here, as you see. But in case of patient affected, affected by Vivax, we, we were able to monitor the evolution uh, of, the, of the thickness due to the treatment. This is at, at zero time, which means I have arrived at the hospital. And after 24 hours after treatment, you see the decrease of the signal till to uh, the complete say, absence of the signal, which means that now I'll say the concentration of parasites was strongly reduced to the to you, due to the treatment. That's first indication of ther ther therapy monitoring, which is possible. But okay, of course, in Italy, it's almost impossible to, to work on, I'll say, on a large number of patients. So in Italy, it was possible just to measure the sensitivity in terms of the capability to reach a low concentration of um, infected red blood cell per microliter. This was done with the model, synthetic model on infected red blood cells. And essentially what we reach is a limit of detection for say this synthetic model on the order of 10 parasites per microliter, which is let's say a quite small number if you consider that in your blood, you have uh, 5 millions of red blood cells per I'll say microliter. It's really, uh, I'll say, a, a, yeah, I'll say it's a challenge um, in terms of engineering of the system, but it was on a model system. Then I'll say, let me skip this. 
we went to Africa, to Cameroon, and we made some campaign in hospital. And this is the results that uh, we, we obtained. So essentially, at that time, we were able to test just 100 um, patients, more or less 100 patients. Uh, and we had some invalid tests, some problem with them. So in the end, just uh, 75 uh, patients uh, were contributing to this table, which is the table in which you classify true positive, false positive, false negative. <laughs> Sorry, very sorry, I didn't switch off my, my mobile phone. So, so uh, you classify now all, let's say, the, the four classes, true positive, false positive, false negative, true negative. And then you, you can get now the typical figure of negative, which are sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity is very high, which means 100%. You, here you see the confidence intervals, which are not so, so small due to the small number of uh, patients. But OK, uh, sensitivity on the order of 100% means that there are no false negative, which means that you are able to really see all people affected by malaria. But on the other hand, specificity, specificity is not so high because we suffer from some false, uh, false positive. But the real message here is that this number, if you take now the confidence intervals, are not, I'll say, not too different from the rapid diagnostic tests, which are now the uh, typically used in practice. So um, you see, um, if you refer to the same results obtained with rapid diagnostic tests, I'll say the sensitivity was 97% as compared with our 100%, 93 hundreds. So, and also for the, I'll say for the, sorry, for, for the specificity uh, with rapid analysis test, we had 82. In our case, it was 70, but for the first trial, it was not too bad. Nevertheless, I'll say this was the first demonstration that it could work and uh, was not granted. So it was to, to, for us quite a big success at that time. And these were, I'll say, the, the figure of merit at that time. So essentially, at that time, we, we obtained the first demonstration of, of, of a system which was suitable for a direct and automatic quantification of parasitemia. And I'll say the interesting story is that this test is, in principle, a pump plus modem test, which means that all species can be detected because I'll say we are detecting the production of the mosaic, which is common to all species which means plasmodium, vivax, malaria, and uh, ovale, all the other species are, can be uh, identified. And uh, it can be used for post-treatment. We need just eight microliter of blood, which means it's compatible with the prick test. And the operation, operation time is five, 10 minutes. And the other point is interesting that uh, you don't need reagents. So the storage condition are really uh, not problem. So you can really move to 50 such a degree. And as a matter of fact, we have been operating at 40 degree in, uh, at, that, uh, at that time. And sensitivity and specific, specificity are those I discussed before. But, okay, this is the white paper that we published. Hmm? So saying that, okay, it works. Um, we also discussed the possibility to disentangle the different states by looking at the waveform because, okay, rings, so late for the light and gametocytes give rise to different wave, uh, waveforms here uh, when you move uh, up and down the magnets. So, and this is due to the, I'll say, to the different, um, I'll say, the ratio between the gravity force and the magnetic force which depends on the state. So if the magnetic force is very high, so each transition will be sharp because of the effect of the magnet approach or, or the uh, so disengagement will be seen very, very fast. If you are dealing with the, the parasite at the early stage, that the content of the emotion is small so that the magnetic force is, is uh, small. And in this case, each transition will be I'll say much, uh, uh, much, uh, uh, I'll say smooth. And, and this is something that can be used. But at that point, the, the critical point was the fact that uh, the quantification on field was difficult. And this is, I'll say, a, a plot showing, I'll say, the signal measure for the different concentration of parasites as calibrated, I'll say, using now uh, the quantification by microscopy. And you see that, I'll say, there is, I'll say, a, a sort of linear correlation, but which is not very good. So these are, I'll say, 
outliners that can be excluded for some reason that I don't uh, uh, describe in details here, but okay, the Pearson coefficient is 0.5. So it's just to say a moderate linear correlation. And the question was, why is that? So in, uh, in, uh, in the laboratory, we are very, very quantitative, but the problem is that in laboratory, we are using a, a, always the same blood from the same donor. So, and you are just changing the concentration of uh, this model of infected red blood cell. In practice, you are dealing with different uh, matrices or different uh, plasma. So that's the problem. And another point is that fluctuation were really affecting our measurement. So one of the development carried out by, by, um, by the guys working on that was first of all, reducing the fluctuation. And fluctuation, you can imagine, could be very detrimental because we are looking for some steps at these red points. But if you have this typical, uh, I'll say, signal, which is just, just due to some drift, the fact that, for instance, there are some bubbles which are created or some, uh, I don't know, something which is happening in your measurement system, that could be a problem. And uh, due to some major modification, the chip layout that I cannot disclose because now they are writing a paper in, uh, pattern on that, now you see the difference. Uh, here the fluctuation was on the order of micro amps, and now you see that the signal is very, very flat. Okay, and this is something which is due to the layout that you are using on the chip. And uh, based on that, I'll say now people was able to do something which is what I called at the very beginning the digital, uh, digital counting of cell. So they obtain a single cell sensitivity. So this is an experiment that I show you in which they are using just four electrodes as measurement and four as reference. And now please look at this video in which you could see the arrival of the infected red blood cells and you, you could appreciate how this arrival is correlated to these steps which really measure the single cell counting. So it's the same on the layout. So uh, you can imagine the vertical configuration, uh, the the, I'll say the ultra red blood cell falling down and some of them, which are those infected are captured. Now you can see what happens. So you see that now we are here, so nothing is happening. And now look at this cell, which is approaching it. Okay, it's captured, see the jump. Now look again, something with another one. And now we are waiting for the next one till the next step. So waiting, waiting, nothing is happening. At some time, you will start seeing that another cell, okay, it's here, okay, and you see another step. So that's a demonstration that we are really able to see, to count a single cell. And that's very important for increasing the sensitivity because in principle, if you are able to count a single cell, you have disentangled just a single cell, so you could reach a much higher sensitivity, which could be very interesting for, for potential application. But this is not the last message. So there is another interesting story, which is uh, also, I'll say the, sorry, I have a problem here, okay. Also, I'll say the amplitude of the, uh, of the jump is correlated to the number of cells which are captured at the same time. So this is an histogram, okay, of the amplitude, okay, which are measured. Hmm? Uh, in terms of the nano amps corresponding to the, amp, uh, to the step amplitude. And you see that looking at this distribution, you can, I'll say, uh, by some fitting, disentangle three peaks. And the interesting story is that three, this peak happens at around 11. The second one happens at something um, which is, I'll say, on the order of, of 30. And I'll say, um, the, this is a single cell, two cells, three cells, and so on. Say so there's something like that, which is easier, is also seen in this case. And the interesting story is that looking at this distribution, you can also use this uh, analysis to disentangle the fact that you have gametocytes or trophozoites. And the reason is quite simple. You see, for a gametocyte, the jumps that you see is on the order of 11 for a single cell, but for trophozoites, which I'll say a different, uh, different stage, you have just seven. So looking at this kind of analysis, you can, you can also distinguish the stage. So that's probably the frontier. And I think that uh, as soon as the condition will have now a new campaign, so the guys working on that will be able to travel. And in my opinion, they could really obtain much more of the interesting results in terms of sensitivity, specificity. 
So I think that's now I'm done. I will, sh I will skip the story of our social mission. And just to conclude saying that that's something which is a work in progress. And I really hope that the guys working on that from now on, they are trying out to, to fund a startup uh, could find a good result in the next future. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay. <clears throat> so thank you very much, Ricardo, for sharing with us this very interesting results. So just my first question is uh, the sensors that you prepare can be used for many tests or it is something you can use just for one test. And the second question that is maybe related to this one is, uh, is this sensor uh, expensive or is, you know, cheap, you know, or at least it can be reused. So then what about the economical aspect? And so for the moment, that's all. <laughs> so, but uh, okay. so thank you very much, Ricardo. Okay, the two questions are correlated, uh, as you yeah. can easily imagine. Because, okay, starting from the first one, so the yeah. chip is reusable. So we have been oh. using a single chip for 300 tests, okay? Oh. So 300 tests and it still works. The reason is quite simple. We are not using any chemistry. We, we don't need to functionalize the surface. So it's just a physical method. So uh, in the end, uh, uh, so we just clean, we just clean the surface by using some soap and then we use some ethanol in order to uh, say, uh, for safety reason, I would yeah. like to say. Yeah. And it's enough because, um, okay, for the red blood cells, which are immobilized, is, it's enough to, to uh, say, to dispense some deionized water and they will explode. So in the end, it's easy to remove them. So the chip is reusable. Now, the yeah. question uh, now is, people is, I'll say, is glad uh, about, so it, it's, uh, it's comfortable with the, the reusage of, of the chip or not. It depends on safety, uh, on safety stories, because when you work on model sample, there is no problem. But if you work with real sample, you don't know if the patient is affected by COVID, by any other, I'll say, uh, yeah. strange uh, infections. So the problem is that uh, clearly um, this, uh, I'll say reconditioning of the, the chip, it's easy, but it requires some, I'll say, some safety. Uh, so it takes some, it brings some safety concerns. Nevertheless, I'll say coming to, to the cost. Now, um, the, the guys trying to, to fund this startup made a sort of cost analysis, which says that uh, with the current technology that we are using, uh, even if you imagine the production of millions of these tests, I'll say the typical cost will be on the order of, of a single test on the order of one euro, which is not too much. But the problem is that a single rapid diagnostic test, which is based on a lateral flow concept, costs typically 20 cents, okay? which is nothing. And even though we can do much better, people is not so glad to pay more. And the problem is something which is just a political problem. So the problem yeah, is that, that African guys cannot really pay for more sophisticated tests. And also the, uh, the, the organization are not, are not willing to pay a lot. Uh, that's the same, same problem of COVID uh, vaccination. So yeah. there is no reason why we are not spending something in the order of uh, a few tens of, of uh, billions of dollars for, to vaccinate Africa, because we could do that. And that could be the solution for a global problem, but sure. we are not doing that. And for the same reason, we are not investing too much in this kind of test because in the end, African guys are not willing to pay. That's a real yeah. problem. You know, the cost of the same test, which cost 20, 20 cents, in, in Africa, in Italy, is uh, more than 10 euros. But it's a problem of market. And malaria is not something affecting Europe. It's not affecting US. So that's so the problem of the cost okay. is something that's uh, it's really um, a crucial point also for this test. So it can do mm, things largely better than existing rapid diagnostic tests, but the cost is a concern. That's why. We are also thinking about different production methods, which could strongly reduce the test. And also the fact of using the test could be one strategy, but okay. I think that your comment was very, very pertinent. 
Okay, thank you very much, Ricardo, for the very nice explanation. Okay, thank you. Let's thanks again, uh, Ricardo. Let's hope that this kind of device can be used maybe in the future because as a very can be help to solve maybe the, the not the, to solve the problems, but at least it can help African citizen with, with this kind of uh, illness. Okay, so I would like also to thank all the speakers again for of this uh, second section. And then I give uh, the floor to first to Davide. Uh, thank you very much for uh, everybody, to, to all the speakers to, to, uh, to give these very nice contributions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gaspare. Thanks, Gaspare. Thanks to, to all the speakers. Now we are going to, to close and would like to, to give the floor to Dino for closing remarks. Thanks, David. So we had a, a very interesting uh, meeting with uh, high-level scientific contributions covering uh, different aspects of uh, fundamental and application properties of nanomaterials. David, Sara, Gaspar, and I would like to thank a lot the speakers for allowing us to organize such very stimulating webinar. And it was very important to do it in order to keep the nano community informed about our conference. The aim of the, this webinar was also to provide a first idea of the much wider spectrum of topics of the nano conference, which is aimed at uh, providing a form of discussion for the latest development in nanoscience and nanotechnology and nanobiotechnology and their applications. So this uh, series of conference was born in 2007 in Brasilia. And in the years, uh, it became uh, an international conference. 3 Nano 2022 uh, in Rome will be the sixth edition of this series. And for the first time, the conference will be held in a country different from uh, France and, and, and Bra Brazil, because it was born just as a bilateral French-Brazilian uh, meeting. Then uh, we have to do absolutely our very best to make the conference in Rome a success, a remarkable sci scientific event, like the previous ones in Brazil and in, in Paris. The founders of the conference were uh, Regine Persinki and uh, and um, Jerome de, de, de Perot, already, already mentioned by Davide. The date of the conference, unfortunately, has not been fixed yet. We are still uh, de defining some aspects about the conference site. But in any case, you will be informed about the date as soon as possible. You truly hope to be able to organize the conference in a present format uh, as in, in the past. And uh, then, um, so for me, it's, um, we, we are arrived at the conclusion. Uh, you will be very welcome in Rome, see you in Rome, and uh, you will, will do the very best in order to make your stay comfortable and uh, enjoyable. So bye. Thank you, thank you, Dino. Thank you, all the speakers. Thank you, all of you for organizing this meeting. Thank you all participants for attending the conference. See you in Rome. Ciao. Bye bye. Thank you.